This is a production of Cornell University. Okay, it's 9.01. Uh, let's get started. Welcome again, everyone, uh, to our Cornell Hemp Research Team Virtual Field Day. It's a beautiful day here in upstate New York, and I wish you all could be here. We would have had a perfect day in the field, but I'm going to uh, look at the silver lining, and that is that we are now up to 213 attendees uh, already matching what we had last year, and that was our max capacity of our field facilities. We've also been able to uh, encourage the participation of people across the country and perhaps around the world through this virtual format. So I think we're going to have a, a broader impact. Uh, we have a, a good lineup of speakers today. We, you see we've broken up the session, the uh, program into three sessions. The first one on hemp breeding and genetics, second on crop management, and the third on supply chains and regulatory updates. Uh, some of those presentations will be made live, some are pre-recorded, and I will play those through my computer. We've allowed a five minute break at the end of each hour because we've realized now with these long Zoom meetings that people need uh, to take a break for a few minutes, get a cup of coffee, use the restroom, et cetera. So I also wanna thank our uh, support from Pixis International and some of my colleagues from Pixis are on as well. Uh, they have sponsored our research now for the second season and have made a strong commitment to extension and outreach to uh, hemp growers across the country. So again, I wanna thank them. So without further ado, uh, I'm going to turn the screen over to uh, my graduate student, George Stack, who is starting the second year of his PhD, uh, who is going to give you a presentation about some of our cannabinoid hemp trials. George. Okay, can everybody hear me? Larry, can you hear me? Yep, I hear you well. Okay. And you can see my screen. Yep, looks perfect. Go for okay. it. As Larry said, my name is George Stack and I'm starting the second year of my PhD in his lab at Cornell Agritech. Today I'm gonna to be talking to you about our high cannabinoid hemp cultivar trials from 2019 and 2020. Um, before I kind of dig in, I'd like to bring up two points. One is that I have posted two fact sheets on our website, one about the 2019 trial and one about the 2020 trial. So there's data that I'm going to be presenting in this talk, as well as additional data that you can check out there. And the second thing I'd like to bring up is that when I talk about THC in this talk, I'm talking about total THC. So this is a, a regulatory issue that I don't really have time to dig into right now, but we'll hopefully discuss uh, it later in the, in the field day, excuse me. Um, so before I, I talk about the data, we need to understand why different cannabis plants accumulate different cannabinoids. And it comes down to this cannabinoid biosynthetic pathway right here. I'm gonna put my pointer on. So we're starting with these precursor compounds that get converted into CBGA, and then the CBGA can get converted into either CBDA by the CBDA synthase enzyme in the plant, or THCA by the THCA synthase enzyme in the plant. And the combination of these two enzymes that a plant has really dictate what cannabinoids it's going to accumulate. So you can imagine if we have a THCA synthase enzyme, but no CBDA synthase enzyme, the plant will accumulate THC, and this is called chemotype one. If we have both a THCA synthase enzyme and a CBDA synthase enzyme, we'll accumulate both CBDA and THCA. This is called chemotype two. If we have just a CBDA synthase enzyme and no THCA synthase enzyme, we'll accumulate CBD. This is called chemotype three. And if we have neither a CBDA synthase enzyme nor a THCA synthase enzyme, we'll accumulate CBG. And this is how you get these high CBG varieties, and this is called chemotype four. So let's look at this in the context of our 2019 CBD cultivar trial. This trial was replicated at two sites, one in Geneva and one in Ithaca. 
at each of these sites, we had 30 cultivars replicated. And so one of the questions that we can ask about the trial is what chemotypes showed up in this 2019 trial? Were all of the plants chemotype three, high CBD plants, as we would expect if we're trying to produce CBD? And the answer to that question is no. So at least seven of the 30 cultivars were not all chemotype three. So this is some cannabinoid data from one cultivar that had chemotypes one, two, and three individuals in it. And you can see that the chemotype one and chemotype two individuals accumulated a lot of THC and exceeded the regulatory threshold. So this is a real problem that growers are being sold chemotype one and two plants when they're expecting chemotype three plants and it causes them to be not compliant. The second question that we asked was how do cannabinoids accumulate over time? And we did this by taking shoot tip samples weekly after terminal flowering for all of the 30 cultivars. And when we look at the data, it looks like this. So let's look at CBD accumulation over time. We have C total potential CBD on our y-axis here, and we have weeks after terminal flowering on our x-axis. Each of these lines is a different one of the cultivars and shows how it accumulates CBD over time. So you can see that for most cultivars, they accumulate quite a lot of CBD in the weeks immediately following terminal flowering. And this makes sense because most of the cannabinoids are concentrated in the trichomes of the female flowers. What's really interesting though is when you compare this graph of CBD accumulation to the graph of THC accumulation. And I'll just flip back and forth between these slides a few times here. And you can see that the curves for each of the cultivars are almost identical. It's just that the scales are different. So the scale for the CBD graph was zero to 20 and the scale for this THC graph is zero to 0.6. And the reason the curves are so similar is because CBD and THC accumulation are coupled in high CBD plants at a fixed ratio. And unfortunately, that means these cultivars here that accumulated high levels of CBD also accumulated enough THC to be above this 0.3% total THC legal threshold, which leaves us a very small window to do regulatory testing and harvest before our cultivars become not compliant. And when we look at this CBD to THC ratio across all of our cultivars, we have CBD to THC ratio on our y-axis here, our cultivars on our x-axis, we see that it's pretty consistent for most cultivars between a 20 to one ratio and 30 to one, 30 to one ratio, excuse me. And that means that at a 0.3% total THC threshold, uh, on average, we can only accumulate about seven to eight percent total CBD uh, before a plant becomes not compliant. The third thing I'd like to talk about is when these plants flowered and the variation in flowering time. So in this graph here, you can see our cultivars on the y-axis and the date on the x-axis. This vertical line is when we transplanted and you, uh, you can see that these bars indicate when each of the cultivars flowered. So we had some that flowered in June, some in July, some in August, some in September, and one even in October. And I've added these circle X's to show when these cultivars exceeded the 0.3% total THC legal threshold. And you can see that it's very strongly correlated and has this, this one to maybe four week window between terminal flowering and exceeding the THC threshold for most cultivars. So in summary, I'm gonna talk about considerations for staying THC compliant when growing for CBD. The first thing we talked about were the different chemotypes of cannabis and how when we're producing CBD, we really want chemotype three plants. The second thing we talked about was the cannabinoid accumulation curves. And so I'm going to stress the importance of regular testing to make sure that you know where you are on that curve and that you're staying under the 0.3% legal threshold. And the third thing I mentioned was that flowering was very strongly correlated with cannabinoid accumulation, which makes sense because cannabinoids are accumulated in the trichomes of the female flowers. So monitoring flowering time is a really good management strategy for staying under that THC threshold. Now I'm gonna briefly talk about our cultivar trials from this year. So we have a CBD cultivar trial and a CBG cultivar trial. So this is chemotype three and chemotype four. Again, we replicated at two sites, one in Geneva and one in Ithaca. 
So just to circle around here, uh, in Geneva, we have a CBD trial with 40 different cultivars in it. And we also have a CBG trial with 12 different cultivars in it. And over here in Ithaca, we have a replicated CBD trial with 32 of the cultivars in it. And we also have a direct seeded essential oil hemp trial, which is a multi-state trial organized by Oregon State. And this has nine cultivars in it. So I'll just share some preliminary data here from our CBD and CBG cultivar trials. So as of Monday, 21 of the 52 cultivars have started to terminally flower. And I've represented that, that flowering time in this plot over here. So this is called a, a violin plot, and it shows the distribution of flowering over the course of um, the last two months or so. And you can see that some cultivars seem to have several distinct groups of flowering time, some early, some late. Several appear to flower just over the course of multiple weeks, but not be really separated into groups. And some all flower very consistently at the same time. So it'll be interesting to see how the, these cultivars continue to mature over the rest of the growing season and how the other 31 cultivars that haven't flowered yet will fit into this scheme. So I'll just say thank you to all of the people who contributed to this research and our funding sources. Um, please put your questions in the chat and I'd be happy to answer them. And this is my contact info if you'd like to talk more about hemp. Thank you. That's great. Thanks very much, George. We're going to try to get on time here and make sure that my sharing of the videos here is working. Uh, we have time for Q&A at the end of the hour. Uh, so I think there will be plenty of time for George to answer your questions. Uh, so it's my pleasure now to introduce Jacob Toth, another PhD student in my lab, uh, who will give you a complimentary talk on our molecular breeding for a compliant fiber type. Hello and welcome everybody to the Cornell Hemp Field Days. My name is Jacob Toth and I'm a PhD candidate in Larry Smart Lab. And today I'll be talking about molecular breeding of hemp. For my talk today, I'll be discussing some of the theory and ideas behind molecular breeding of hemp and give an example of how we're using molecular breeding in our research program to develop a high yielding fiber cultivar that has low levels of THC to stay compliant, as well as produces high levels of CBD. It is important to recognize the contribution of genetics and environment to your trait of interest for any breeding endeavor. So how the plant grows, the phenotype, is there about, there's the result of both the genetics of the plant as well as the environment. The genetics of the plant, also known as the genotype, refers to the DNA of the plant, the genes and other DNA which make up the plant's genome. So many important traits such as yield are heavily influenced by both the genotype and the environment, but some traits such as photoperiod dependence and cannabinotype are heavily influenced by genotype alone. Concerning photoperiod dependence, if you look at this picture here, the small plant is photoperiod independent and started flowering almost immediately after planting, while the larger plant, which is photoperiod dependent, didn't start flowering until the night length hit a certain threshold. So another important trait that is influenced heavily by genotype in cannabis is cannabinoid type. And breeding for cannabinoid type is a fundamental part of any hemp breeding. So what is molecular breeding? So in molecular breeding, very broadly, instead of just looking at the phenotype of the plant, which is a result of both the genotype and the environment, you look at the actual DNA. So advances in molecular biology have allowed much easier analysis of DNA. And because the DNA is the same in every cell of a plant, whether it's young or whether it's old, being able to assay a plant just by looking at the DNA allows you to look at certain traits before they're even expressed. For instance, 
to determine if a plant is going to be male or female, or if it's going to produce mostly THC or mostly CBD. So with molecular breeding, you can develop new cultivars based on the genotype alone. And when done accurately, this can result in less expensive phenotyping and ultimately reducing the cost and reducing the time it takes to develop a new cultivar. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about how our research group is using molecular breeding to develop new elite high yielding fiber cultivars that have compliant levels of THC. In 2019, we grew several varieties for grain and fiber production, including two cultivars from China called Dama and Puma. We didn't know much about these cultivars when we first planted them, aside from a little blurb for Puma, which claimed to have high CBD seeds, high leaves and flowers output. When these plants were grown, we were quite impressed by the plants in that they had extremely large leaves and extremely fast growth rate and would routinely hit 10 feet tall. When we harvested these plants and redded them to measure the fiber yield, we found that Bama and Puma had nearly double the biomass yield of other elite cultivars grown for fiber. Because of this, we thought that Bama and Puma would make excellent fiber cultivars. However, when we looked at the cannabinoids, we found that both Puma and Bama produced THC at levels exceeding 0.3% and would be non-compliant in the modern regulatory framework. We looked further at the cannabinoids that Puma and Bama were producing, and we found that they were relatively high in cannabinoids, with Puma producing a little over 1.5% total cannabinoids and Bama sometimes exceeding 2% total cannabinoids. This is considerably higher than what other fiber cultivars produced in terms of total cannabinoids. Additionally, we sampled these plants when they were just starting to flower, so we hypothesized that as the plant became more mature, the total cannabinoids would increase even further. However, the big problem was that Puma and Bama produced THC as a major cannabinoid, which isn't what we wanted. So ultimately, what we would like in a cultivar would be something that produces as much dry biomass as Puma and Bama, but instead of producing THC, produces CBD. And to achieve that goal, we turn to molecular breeding. So to understand what we did for molecular breeding, it's first important to understand the different chemotypes that are found in cannabis. So there are three important chemotypes that I'll talk about right now. There's type one, which is mostly THC. There's type two, which is CBD to THC at about a two to one ratio, but this number can vary. And then there's type three, which produces mostly CBD. So if you're growing a population or a cultivar for CBD, you'd expect all the plants to be type three. But in 2018 and 2019, we found that some of the plants that we were growing were in fact type two or even type one, producing almost no CBD. Using this data, and this figure in the top here shows data from 2018, we developed a molecular marker which looks at the DNA of the plants and can distinguish type one from type two and type three plants. So getting back to Bama and Puma, when we were looking at the THC to CBD ratio for these plants, we saw that it was about a two to one ratio of CBD to THC, which would suggest that most of the plants that we were sampling were type two. So an interesting thing about these type two plants is that they won't breed true. If there's a population which is freely intercrossing with a lot of these type two plants, you'd expect to see a certain number to be type one and a certain number to be type three. So we didn't have the HPLC, the chemical data on a lot of different plants from Bama and Puma. We were just looking at pooled samples, but we could apply this molecular marker to these populations and distinguish the different plants that were in these different chemotypes. So late last year, around December, we grew about 100 plants each of Bama and Puma and tested them with this marker that we developed. And as expected, we found that about half of the plants were type two 
And we found that about a third of the plants were type 3, and then the remainder were type 1. So what we did was we selected the type 3, and in theory, these plants should form an excellent basis for a high-producing fiber cultivar that produces mostly CBD. However, after selection of these type 3 plants, we run into a few problems with their propagation. So these plants, which are so vigorous in the field, are also very vigorous in a greenhouse, and they grew extremely fast and extremely tall, sometimes in excess of 14 feet. They were also quite susceptible to various greenhouse pathogens, such as thrips and spider mites. To make matters worse, they appear to be very photoperiod dependent and did not flower in the greenhouse in the spring when we were growing them. There were also some issues with cutting propagation. These plants form a very nice single stem, as you can see in this photo here, but it's not always simple to take a cutting and root that very nice stem. So to address this, we're attempting to grow the plant in the field. We've planted them out and hopefully we'll harvest some grain at the end of the season, which will form a good basis for scale up. And we've also sent the cuttings of these plants to a collaborator in Florida who should be able to grow the plants without any issue. In summary, molecular breeding involves selection on the genotype, on the DNA directly. Bama and Kuma, two cultivars from China, are high biomass producers, but they produce high non-compliant levels of THC. Selection in, in Bama and Puma for chemotype 3 plants using a molecular marker should produce a high yielding compliant fire cultivar. These plants here growing in the field in New York should form the basis of a new compliant fiber cultivar. We hope to harvest the seeds at the end of the season, scale them up, ensure that the resultant plants have the same biomass potential as their parent pa Bama and Puma populations, and eventually, potentially release new cultivars. Okay, thanks very much, Jacob. Uh, we are now going to switch to uh, my postdoc, Craig Carlson, uh, who is out at the field in our one of our breeding trials. So Craig is going to talk about uh, some F1 hybrids that he has produced and show you some of their traits. All righty, Larry, can you see me? Yes, we can. All right. Hello everybody, my name is Craig Carlson. I'm a postdoc with Cornell Hemp. Uh, I work on breeding genetics and genomics of hemp. And I've got Chris Smart here with me recording and we are more than six feet apart. So uh, let's, get this, uh, let's get this thing rolling. Uh, so uh, if you've been with the hemp industry for about three or four years, uh, you'll know that there is a big need for cultivar development. Uh, for many years, uh, we've seen uh, uniformity in the field in grain and fiber cultivars, uh, but we've also seen a lot of uh, 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 issues with uniformity in uh, high cannabinoid cultivars. Uh, so we're standing in our breeding and selection trial right now. And this trial consists of 24 families uh, uh, of 24 individuals uh, crossed with a common parent, TJ, and that's owned by STEM Holdings. It's been kind of our uh, model hemp plant uh, for the past three or four years. Uh, so typically when we conduct these high cannabinoid trials, uh, we'll space plants about four feet apart and have about six foot alleys. Uh, we'll do uh, weekly measurements of plant height. Uh, we'll look at leaf area, uh, branching angle, uh, number of nodes within the uh, canopy, uh, plant canopy width, and so we can get a nice uh, shape descriptor for those individuals. And that's what I've seen is really lacking in the uh, literature uh, is, uh, uh, is 
shape descriptors that are very basic, right? So tree form, you know, globe shape, columnar, et cetera. Uh, so all of these uh, families have been crossed with TJ or an inbred uh, S1 or S2 of TJ. What I wanna show you is how some of these phenotypes are segregating in these families. Because TJ is actually quite heterozygous, uh, but the parents are heterozygous to more inbred. So I wanna show you kind of what uh, our important traits are doing in the field and uh, the differences between crossing heterozygous with heterozygous and heterozygous with inbred material. So if we can get Chris to move over here. Uh, this, this row right here is a uh, TJ's S2, meaning that we selfed TJ's using STS uh, to produce pollen, silver thiosulfate, uh, selected an individual, and then uh, selfed that uh, progeny from that individual. So it's an S2 population. And what I was going for with this family was to select an S1 that looked a lot more like the parent. Uh, but what we are finding out, what we have found out, is that uh, TJ is actually heterozygous for a uh, flowering time gene. And so this is an S2 family in this row. And what we see is that a lot of these early flowering individuals are fairly uniform. And many of the later flowering individuals are fairly uniform. So there is some uniformity, but it's just so dramatic what differences in flowering time can do to a family. So if we wanna come over here, Chris, we're gonna look at a, another family, another S2. And okay. All right, Chris, this is, this is TJ. This is that common parent of all of these F1s. It has a really irregular shape to it, kind of drooping leaves. It's a high cannabinoid uh, uh, hemp type. I also, in that S1, made a selection of a uh, early flowering individual. So it's kind of homozygous for that flowering time gene. And as you can see, it's far more uniform uh, besides differences really in maybe plant size, but small differences in plant size. And it's far more uniform that, than that other S1 that was segregating for the flowering time locus. There are some uh, really interesting uh, families. Uh, yeah, okay, they got dropped again. Uh, so we are going to move on uh, to our next presentation. Through hybrid Chris, we're going to move on. Yeah, we're going to move on. We're going to move on. Okay, uh, and Craig is going to run into the uh, office here so he can join our Q&A. Uh, so our next presentation is from Jamie Crawford. Good morning, everyone. Uh, who will be talking about our grain and fiber trials, uh, mostly in Ithaca. So let me get that going for you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Jamie Crawford, and I'll be giving you a brief update on our hemp, grain, and fiber trials. Our trial design is a randomized complete block where each entry is replicated four times. Plots are four feet wide and 20 feet long, and seeding rate is calculated based on the germination rate and seed weight of each entry so that 20 live seeds are planted per square foot in the grain and dual trials, and 40 live seeds are planted per square foot in the fiber trials. Complete hemp grain and fiber reports for each year can be found on our website, but this graph shows the range of grain yields in Ithaca and Geneva by year. The yields for 2017 and 2019 were quite similar, ranging from seven to 800 pounds per acre, for the lower yielding entries to 1,300 to 1,400 pounds per acre in the higher yielding entries. Decrease in yield in 2018 
was due to the timing of harvest. One location was harvested too early before grain was mature in all entries, and one location was harvested too late with much of the grain lost to shattering our birds. When harvesting for grain, timing is very important. Fiber yields in 2017 were low due to poor seed quality and very thin stands. With new higher germinating seed lots in 2018 and 2019, entries were yielding between five and six dry tons per acre before redding and two and a half to three and a half dry tons per acre after redding. We established grain and fiber trials in two locations this spring. The first in Geneva planted on June 4th and the second planted in Ithaca on June 6th. Ithaca had received six tenths of an inch more rain than in Geneva in the two weeks leading up to planting and this made a huge difference in the success of the trials. Because the field was so dry when it was prepped for planting, hard baked chunks of soil limited seed soil contact. Had we received the predicted rain, it could have been okay, but the lack of rain in the weeks after planting led to poor emergence, and then the trial was overrun by weeds. The additional soil moisture at the Ithaca location led to a finer seedbed, excellent emergence, and what should have been an excellent stand if our cone seeder hadn't been slowly breaking as we were planting. While we were planting the Ithaca trials, the load bar which supported the packer wheels was slowly twisting, planting some of the rows more deeply and packing the soil over top of them very firmly. We planted the fiber trial first that day and all six rows emerged, but by the last plot planted that day, only two rows emerged as expected. The planter was repaired and then the grain and dual purpose trials were replanted on June 24th. Since these hemp varieties are photoperiod sensitive, planting later leads to shorter plants. The tops of the signs in both pictures are 30 inches from the ground. Piccolo plant at the beginning of June is close to four feet tall. Piccolo plant at the end of June is two and a half feet tall. Canola is over five feet tall in the original planting and not quite four feet tall in the replant. We expect the grain yields to be similar between these trials, but shorter entries are more susceptible to weed pressure. For my remaining time, I'd like to show you some pictures of our trials here in Ithaca, New York. We'll start out with the fiber trial. The fiber trial was planted on June 6th, so it's from the original planting and has four entries. There are two new entries this year. The one on the left is called Yuma Crossbow. We had some conflicting information on whether it should be included in the dual purpose or the fiber trial. And as you can see here, we made the wrong choice. It's actually earlier flowering than some of the entries in our dual purpose trials, and we will be harvesting it for grain later this month. The other new entry this year is Jinma, and uh, it is a little bit later maturing than the Italian varieties we have in the trial as sort of our checks, and it's looking really good so far. Our grain trial has eight entries, starting on the left with X59. There's CRS-1 in the middle and Canda on the right. In this photo, that's Canda again on the left, followed by USO31 in the middle and Hanola on the right. And then finally, this photo has Piccolo on the left, Joey in the middle, and CFX2 on the right. Our dual purpose trials has 15 entries this year. Uh, first, there on the left, you can see NWG Elite, followed by NWG Abound, and Felina 32. In the second slide, you see Fedora 17, Vega, and then Anka. This slide is Futura 75 on the left, Alicia in the middle, and Bia Jobretsky on the right. This slide contains the variety we're calling H51 on the left, Hiliana in the center, and Rigel on the right. The final three entries in our dual purpose trial are Altair on the left, Pheromon in the middle, and Voico on the right. I'm so disappointed that we can't be together in person to show off our trials properly. 
When we've held field days in the past, I've noticed that people just cannot help but touch and smell the plants. I can't send the smells of the hemp field to you, but here is a video of one of our technicians petting the hemp plots for you to enjoy vicariously. And with that, I'll take any questions. Okay, thanks very much, Jamie. That was a great uh, look at the beautiful trials we have this year in Ithaca. Unfortunately, our trials here in Geneva suffered from the drought. They don't look nearly as pretty as the ones in Ithaca. So we have now come to our uh, first Q&A session. Uh, we're right on time, so we have 15 minutes for live Q&A. And uh, I am going to, I would encourage the panelists to unmute their video. And I'm going to go through some of the uh, excellent questions we got in the chat uh, and start with uh, George for this one. There's a very good question about how you define uh, the start of flowering and uh, what we mean by terminal flowering versus uh, axillary flowering, if you could elaborate on that a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question. Um, so one of the things that's challenging about um, female flowering in hemp is that not all of the cultivars flower in the exact same way. So their, their floral morphology is different. Um, so we define terminal flowering as a cluster of female flowers at the shoot tips. And we found that that was a, a pretty consistent way to mark all of the cultivars at the same physiological point. I will note that some cultivars do form axillary flowers, just one single small female flower in the axils of the leaves uh, a lot earlier, but that is very variable and is not a great indicator of when the plants will start terminally flowering. Yeah, it, it can get tricky. Uh, definitely you want to get uh, a loop or some other magnifying glass so you can look at uh, the development of the trichomes as well. You want to see the development from clear trichomes to milky and then to amber and that those will be your cues as to the uh, time of maturity and the time of harvest. Uh, Jacob, I'll point this one to you. There's a question about whether we are breeding uh, cultivars uh, that are high in uh, varin cannabinoids or CBC, as an example. Um, yes, I'll answer that question. So last year we tested several varieties and especially a few from China had quite high varin concentrations. But just like as I was talking about with Bama and Puma, they tended to mostly be THCV. They tended to be mostly type one and type two. We're actually currently growing a large population that we intend to screen with a molecular marker to pull out the type three plants. And we hope that those type three plants in that population that produces a lot of varins will produce a lot of CBDV. So in theory, if this works and you can get high varins, we may be able to develop a dual purpose CBDV grain or fiber cultivar. As for CBC, we're seeing some very interesting results, especially in some of these high CBD cultivars. We have one that produced up to 2% CBC. Um, we're currently working to understand the basis of that production. Um, but at the moment, we're not actively working to create any pure high CBC lines. And just to follow on, there are a couple more questions uh, that I'll aim at you uh, regarding CBG. Uh, so maybe you could briefly describe the genetic systems. Uh, George did touch on this, uh, of how we get a high CBG line and what would happen if that CBG line were segregating, for example, uh, were heterozygous for an active THCA synthase or was heterozygous for an active CBDA synthase? Yeah, I can answer that question. So all cannabinoids start off as CBGA. So that's what it starts at. And then if there's an active CBDA or an active THCA, that enzyme converts the CBGA to THCA or CBDA. So in the absence of those enzymes, you get a CBGA dominant plant. Now, if you have a plant that's heterozygous, 
for a CBDA synthase or a THCA synthase. That's something that we're looking at. We're not 100% sure what the result will be. It depends on the activity of this enzyme. If there's a lot of that enzyme in this heterozygous case, it's possible that we'll get the same conversion from CBGA to CBDA or THCA, but it's also possible that in the heterozygous case, the enzyme wouldn't be expressed at high enough levels to fully convert the CBGA to CBDA or THCA. And in that case, we would expect to see an intermediate value. We currently have a few F1s growing in the field between chemotype three and chemotype four, and we'll be testing those uh, once they start to flower. But at the moment, we don't have any hard data. Uh, so there's probably going to be some variation. There is a significant amount of variation in um, CBDA synthase enzymes. We would expect some to be more active than others. So uh, in short, it probably varies and we're working to figure that out. Great, yeah. We should again qualify that much of the results that were presented today are mid-season results. We have not analyzed any of the cannabinoids uh, from the 12 CBG lines that, were, uh, that we have in trials. So stay tuned. Uh, I'm going to point to Jamie. There's an excellent question about uh, pollination and how do we maintain these uh, feminized CBD trials at the same time we're also doing uh, grain and fiber trials. So Jamie, you touched on that in the chat box, but let's elaborate on that. Okay, so um, here in, in Ithaca, our, our terrain is very um, full of hills and gorges and, and, you know, very different landscapes that way. And so we, by mileage, we keep all of our trials at least one mile apart. But then in addition to that, they're definitely separated by lots of landscape features. So our CBD and essential oil trials are on an area that's pretty much surrounded by by forested areas to sort of as an additional barrier to try and keep the pollen out of those areas. And there's another uh, set of questions in there about irrigation. Uh, so did we irrigate through the drought and uh, how was fertilization done? So this is one of the major differences between our current CBD cultivation practices, which are based on plastic culture and drip irrigation versus the broad acre uh, grain and fiber cultivation. So you wanna talk about that a little bit, Jamie? Sure, so none of our fiber and grain trials were irrigated. Um, we did our very best guess on when to plant based on the weather forecast and what we could see but we did not, because they have to be separated by so far, by such a great distance, um, a lot of the areas where we would plant our grain and fiber trials are not necessarily in spots where we even could irrigate if we wanted to. Um, so the grain trials are all, the fields are fertilized before we plant with, um, I believe this year we used 2299. It was our fertilizer, and so it was broadcast on the fields at a rate of about 75 pounds of nitrogen per acre. And then at, at about a month into the planting, the fiber trials and the grain trials were given an additional um, 70 pounds of nitrogen per acre as ammonium sulfate. The CBD trials, I mean, uh, Craig is there. He could probably talk more about those. Those were all through the, the drip irrigation. Yep. So we've been injecting a water-soluble fertilizer. Uh, we did uh, include uh, granular fertilizer as we uh, laid the beds uh, at about 90 pounds of nitrogen to the acre. And then we have supplemented that with soluble uh, 12, 5, 16 fertilizer uh, through the drip line. We've done that twice in our CBD trials. At this point, most of those CBD plants are in flower or very close to flower. Uh, so we will not add any additional fertilizer at this point. Uh, although there's a lot of research that needs to be done to clarify 
uh, a best practice here, an optimum management practice, but uh, at, our plants are quite large right now and uh, encouraging additional vegetative growth uh, may not be beneficial overall at this point. So many other good questions in here and we're gonna do our best to answer them. Uh, if we can't answer them uh, in this Q&A session, by all means, follow up with us afterwards or follow up with your local Cornell Cooperative Extension Specialist. Uh, there's a question about why sending the Chinese fiber plants to Florida? Was there not supplemental lighting in the greenhouse? What's going on here? Jacob, do you want to answer that question about uh, critical day length of Chinese, these Chinese varieties versus other grain and fiber types, for example? So there's a lot that we don't know about these plants. Um, we've, we've run some uh, GBS on them and uh, Craig has some interesting data about them and they tend to be quite genetically distinct and quite genetically distinct, especially from other grain and fiber types. Uh, so what we think is going on is that it requires a very short day length. We don't know what that critical photo period is. For a lot of our full season CBD varieties, once the day length gets below about 14 hours, we start seeing flowering. For these plants, it might be considerably lower. It might be 13 hours, we don't know. Um, but in Florida, which is a lot closer to the equator, we're expecting the day length to be shorter. Um, and in Florida, the East Collaborator has also been testing the, these lines and uh, they flowered late in Florida, um, but they flowered and they were able to harvest seed. In our trials, we didn't push it to the last possible second, um, but we were not able to harvest seed from these varieties. Um, and we think it's due to a very short um, photo period uh, requirement for these plants to flower. Um, so in the greenhouse, uh, the plants were mature around March or so. And at that point, uh, some of the plants were just starting to flower, but we don't have a shade curtain and the day lengths are starting to get too long at that point. And then the plants that were starting to flower ceased flowering, went back to vegetative. So ultimately, if we had a shade curtain and could block out the sun, we might have been able to get them to flower, but we don't have that facility yet. Yep. So the problem was actually not uh, supplemental lighting, but our lack of ability to uh, deprive the plants, to shade the plants uh, and keep them dark. So we're very much looking forward to having that light deprivation shading so that we can control flowering all 12 months of the year, even when the days are get too long, uh, which is in March and April. Uh, some other questions, there's a good question from Paul about whether molecular breeding can be used for pest and disease resistance. Uh, that is a great lead in uh, to our next talks uh, in the next session, uh, starting at 10 o'clock, uh, where Chris and Allie will talk about uh, some of our work on uh, powdery mildew resistance. So yes, we are confident that we will be able to develop molecular markers for at least for some disease resistance. Uh, other questions, there are questions about uh, recommendations for the best cultivars uh, for dual purpose. And uh, let me also get back to a question about a dual purpose fiber and CBD cultivars. So we have posted our, our grain and fiber trial results on our website, so please look those over. I will say there is variability in the quality of seed lots from year to year still. That is a, still a major issue in the industry is the ability to get reliably high quality seed from year to year. Uh, finding a local seed source uh, helps with that. So we have had very good uh, relationship with uni seeds uh, just across the border in Ontario in providing us high quality seed. Uh, but please, please look over those results uh, and recognize that uh, they are still only on a relatively small number of sites and soil types in New York State. I'll just say in general that 
hemp demands the highest quality soils uh, you have in your farm. It requires uh, a deep, rich loam that is well drained. Uh, so don't believe the hype that uh, hemp can grow on marginal soils. Or as uh, one of my good friends and colleagues said, uh, you can grow it on marginal soil and you'll get marginal yield. Uh, so it's a good question about uh, producing CBD and fiber. Uh, so the CBD is produced in the female flowers and to get the optimum fiber, long quali uh, high quality long fiber, you need to harvest relatively early, right at the start of flowering. But there may well be enough CBD produced in those flowers at that point in the development that you can get a reasonable yield of CBD as well as your yield of high quality fiber. And uh, Hemp Flax has produced a harvester that has a flower harvesting combine head that can rise quite high and chop those flower heads and at the same time be chopping the fiber. Uh, so uh, we look forward to the industry continue, continuing to expand and develop that machinery so that we can potentially do a, a dual purpose uh, CBD and fiber harvest. And I'll just answer one more question in here that I noticed. Uh, what about going to a broad acre cultivation for CBD. Uh, that's definitely a trend that we're seeing in the industry. We're seeing in Colorado uh, center pivot irrigation and broad acre planting uh, for CBD. We actually have two trials uh, planted this year, uh, direct seeded uh, CBD trials, one at very high density, similar to our grain and fiber trials, and the other a little bit lower planted on 30 inch spacing. Uh, that we thin down to 12 or 18 inches between plants. Uh, so we have a, a flower combine header on order. It should come in in a couple of weeks. And that's what we look forward to researching next year. The end of this year and next year is focusing more on broad acre plantings and combine harvesting of flower heads for CBD. Uh, so I'm going to pause right here and we have a five minute break. Uh, so continue to ask your questions in the chat box so the panelists can respond to that. Uh, and we will be back and start our program again at 10 o'clock. Thank you, everyone. Okay, welcome back, everyone. Uh, it's 10 o'clock and we're going to resume our program. Uh, Next on our program, well, we're starting our second session on hemp crop management uh, with some of our pathologists and entomologists and weed scientists in this group, starting with a live presentation from graduate student Ali Kalla in the field uh, with Chris Smart. Uh, so Chris, you are muted. You can go ahead and unmute and we will start the presentation. Okay, hi. Um like Larry said, my name's Allie, Allie Kalla. I'm a graduate student in Chris Smart's lab, who is out here with me. Um, of course, we're staying six feet apart. And also out here is um, another lab member of ours, Colin Day. Um, so sorry in advance if we uh, disconnect, we're, we're gonna do our best. But um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about some of my research. So I'm looking mostly at a pathogen called powdery mildew which um, we have out here in the field that we wanted to show you. And we are working with Larry's lab to do some um, uh, looking for resistance for powdery mildew, but I wanted to talk a little bit about a different project today um, about how powdery mildew can affect uh, secondary metabolites in uh, hemp. So we all know about uh, some secondary metabolites like cannabinoids, like which include CBD and CPG. But there's another class of secondary metabolites that hemp uh, produces a lot of, which are terpenes. Um, and terpenes are a volatile, are volatile compounds that are also produced by the flower and are responsible for the um, fragrance and flavor of the uh, hemp flowers. So we have, um, three major questions that we're 
trying to address with this project. The first being how can, how do the terpene profiles in hemp change throughout the season and how does flowering time affect those terpene profiles? And so for that project, we are collecting terpene samples uh, weekly throughout the season from the same plant. Um, and so our second question is how, do, how does a biological fungicide affect the uh, terpene profiles? And for that uh, project, we have uh, been treating some plants with a bacillus-based biological fungicide um, according to the label rate. And we've taken samples from a from plants that were treated and plants that were untreated. And I recently inoculated those plants with powdery mildew. And once an infection is established, we'll take another collection from those plants and we'll be able to see how those um, compare. And then the third question is more relating to um, the pathogens themselves and how the pathogens can affect terpene profiles as well as cannabinoid profiles. Um, and for that one, we're adding in a second pathogen, Botrytis gray mold. So we are, we'll have plants inoculated with powdery mildew, plants inoculated with Botrytis and healthy plants. And we'll take terpene samples from all three of those types of plants and see how the terpene levels differ. Um, and for, the, that, um, for that project as well, at the end of the season, we will also take um, flower samples so that we can look at cannabinoid profiles as well. So for collecting terpenes, it's a little bit um, more challenging and we have to get a little bit more creative since those compounds are volatile. So we have kind of an interesting setup for our collection that we kind of wanted to talk about and show you today. Um, so we have our setup here and we use these um, turkey bags. They're just these plastic bags that you people use to cook turkeys in. So we, I actually have to bake these so that we don't have to um, have any interference with chemicals from the bags and what we're collecting. And we take these bags and we just secure them around a part of the plant that we want to collect, usually a part that has flowers. Um, we secure it at the base with some zip, zip ties to make it um, nice and secure. And then from there, we cut two holes in the bag, one so we have airflow in and one so we have airflow out. For the hole that is the airflow in, we secure a filter so that the air coming in isn't going to contaminate our sample. And then for the airflow out, we have, um, it's connected to some tubing, which is then connected to um, a collection tube, which has a filter inside that the compounds can stick to. Then the collection tube is connected to a pump, which provides the airflow. And all of this equipment is um, provided to us by Dennis Willis Lab, who we're collaborating with on this project. And uh, once we have our um, collection on this tube, it goes directly onto a machine called a gas, uh, spec gas spectrometer and mass <laughs> gas chromatograph, sorry, <laughs> and mass spectrometer. Um, and that machine can allow us to see what compounds are there and at what levels they're there. So we can um, determine a secondary metabolite profile for all, all of our samples. And uh, the GCMS is also provided by the Dennis Willett Lab, who is working with us on this project. And they're kindly letting us use all of this equipment. Um, so uh, that is what I've got for my secondary metabolite project. Oh, yes. And um, we have some more powdery on this plant is part of the reason we're out in this trial. We have some nice examples of powdery out here. So um, I'm look for looking forward to answering any questions later during the Q&A session. Larry. Uh, back, back to Larry. <laughs> OK, great. Thank Th you. Thanks very much. Uh, that worked great. Uh, <laughs> and. Uh, 
folks can definitely see that uh, we have our share of powdery mildew in our trials. Uh, and I'm going to shift now to start the presentation from Jen Starr in Gary Bergstrom's lab. And she will give you some excellent descriptions of other diseases uh, we have had in hemp. Hello and welcome to the 2020 Virtual Cornell Hemp Research Team Field Day. My name is Jennifer Starr and I am the Research Support Specialist for Dr. Gary Bergstrom's Field Crops Pathology Laboratory. I also work alongside Kevin Myers who helps with scouting for hemp disease and does our molecular testing. Today I'll be giving a brief overview of foliar diseases and possible management strategies. I want to focus this talk on just a few things. To highlight, I will start with septoria leaf spot and bipolaris leaf spot, also known as hemp leaf spot. Then I will move to lesser impact emerging leaf diseases such as downy mildew and hemp rust. Septoria leaf spot is caused by the fungus septoria species and symptoms begin on the lower leaves of the plant as irregularly shaped spots with yellow margins. These spots expand over time, turn brown, and the yellow margins broaden to look something like this. This was observed in eastern New York in 2019 and in eastern and western New York in 2020. In this slide, I have a video of what septoria leaf spot looks like in the field. And as you can see, it is on the lower leaves, bigger brown spots with the bigger yellow margins. This is septoria leaf spot. The next highlight is bipolaris leaf spot, also known as hemp leaf spot. This is caused by a fungus that's being classified as bipolaris gigantea, related to Drechlera gigantea. Symptoms start as round specks and spots that coalesce over time. And sometimes they have a dark margin here with lighter tan interiors, or sometimes don't have any margin at all. We have noticed this leaf spot disease since Cornell's hemp team um, started the program a few years back. And we usually notice this at the end of the growing season. And we've noticed this throughout New York State this is not a super high impact um, disease as other states have seen it defoliate plants. We have not seen that yet in New York State. Next up, we have downy mildew, um, lesser impact uh, emerging disease. This is caused by Pseudopernospora cannabina, which has just been recently ID'd by sequencing uh, last week. The spots uh, start out as these light green yellow spots with necrotic margins. And the lower surface of the leaf, you can actually see the fungus growing in humid conditions, or if you catch it um, in the morning time when the dew is still on the plant. Um, later on, the lesions become a little more angular and are defined by the leaf veins of the hemp plant. This was just recently observed in Ithaca last week, so in 2020. And in the next slide, I have a video of what it looks like on the plant. And this is a good um, example of how the veins of the leaf are demarcating the spot and confining it, as you see here. This is downy mildew on hemp. Our last feature is hemp rust. And hemp rust has been morphologically identified as Urito crigariana. And again, this is something we're going to want to be looking on the lower surface of the leaf. We have yellow to orange pustules or spots on the lower surface. And on the upper surface, we have these necrotic areas with very faint chlorosis around them. And then sometimes rust disease systems have alternate hosts to complete their life cycle. We have not 
found an alternate host with this hemp rust. Um, sometimes rust disease systems don't have alternate hosts. Uh, we found this last year at the end of the growing season in October of 2019. We will be looking again this year um, for this so we can try to study it further. The following slide is a close-up of what the pustule looks like on the undersurface of the leaf and what is inside that pustule. These are uridinospores of hemp rust. We do see other um, hemp leaf spots. I wanted to include a quick um, summary of those here. We see Cristulariella zonate leaf spot. We see Cercospiral leaf spot. We see some Cilium leaf spot. And we also see a number of other diseases that are not leaf spots. We see Fusarium bud blight, which could have implications for quality of flowers and grain. We see Fusarium wilt. We see white mold. And we see Botrytis gray mold. So as you can see, in addition to leaf spot diseases, we do see and work on other diseases that are affecting hemp. So possible product treatments, we are directing um, growers to go to the DEC, New York DEC webpage at this address and go to pesticide product information, hit search. This will bring you to advanced search. You want to click that, press search which will then bring you to pesticide use. You want to choose hemp industrial, hit search. That will bring up about 98 products, most of which are biologic in nature, some bacillus type products. You want to check the labels on those to make sure hemp is included. All of this information again is present on the Cornell Hemp webpage under the FAQ heading. In addition to the DEC webpage, we want to use best agronomic practices. This will be second nature to seasoned growers and producers, but we want to start with prevention, um, with having reliable seed source and good soil health. It is a myth that hemp can be produced on marginal soils. We want fertile soil, well-drained soil. We want our plant spacing to be such where we're reducing the humidity between the plants because uh, fungus really loves to be in humid places. It encourages it, its growth. Sanitation, very important. We want to remove debris off-site. Um, you may burn it, you may compost it, but we want it away from the hemp field. Weed control, also very important. We have noticed Cercosper growing on weeds. We have noticed downy mildew growing on weeds. Are those weeds vectors um, for fungal growth to the hemp, or is it the other way around? We are still investigating that, um, but it's important to keep those weeds in control and out of the way. Crop rotation, also something to note. Um, edible beans, soybeans, sunflowers, uh, and their white molds, uh, probably not a great idea to follow hemp after those crops. Also in question recently, corn and cereal crops producing mycotoxins um, will it be wise to put hemp after those crops? And then resistant cultivars, um, something that our program here at Cornell are working towards now. If you have questions about your hemp crop and have problems and want some diagnostics, um, it may be wise for you to contact your Cornell Cooperative Extension educator. Um, if you don't know who yours is, you may go to the uh, Cornell hemp page and find who your representative is. Um, if you would like to submit samples to uh, my lab, you may submit them through your Cornell Cooperative Extension educator through them to us. Um, we may not give you the best turnaround time, but it will be of no charge to you. Or if you're looking for some quick results, you can use our plant disease diagnostic clinic at Cornell and it is a fee for service. Uh, it's relatively low cost. I believe it's $30 to $35 if you're in state, $50 if you're out of state, and I've left um, the contact information for you here. Again, all of this information is on the Cornell team webpage. 
I'm going to leave you with our lab's contact information. This is Dr. Gary Bergstrom's email address. This is my email address and our laboratory phone number if you have further questions after this talk today. Thanks for your time, and I hope you enjoy the rest of Cornell's virtual hemp talks today. Thanks very much, Jen. We're a little bit ahead of schedule now. Uh, we have a couple of minutes for questions. Uh, so I do see a couple of questions in the chat box. Uh, if Jen or Gary are available and want to follow up on those questions, one is, uh, are any of these products uh, OMRI listed? I'll just jump in, this is Gary. Uh, there are quite a few things listed with uh, fungicidal or insecticidal activity on the OMRI list, and uh, a lot of those are on the DEC list. Uh, the term suggested is, is uh, problematic because there's very, there's very little uh, test data uh, supporting efficacy at this point. And I know that, uh, that Chris and, and her lab is looking at that in the context of mildew and whatnot. We, we've done some fairly rudimentary testing uh, for some of the late season things, but really there's not, there's not a database there to, uh, to point to. So we have counseled growers uh, to look at uh, a few materials that have uh, efficacy in other crop areas. Um, so we have some insights that they might work and, and to try to, to do some treated strips and leave some non-treated to try to learn something here. But uh, recommendations are, are a bit elusive, uh, at least for us in New York at this point. There's another question specifically about uh, Bacillus fungicides uh, Cease or Serenade. I don't know if Chris has included those in her trial. I see Chris is on, uh, or, but, but again, the trial is underway. We don't have results at this point, as Gary mentioned. Uh, it's definitely an active uh, area of research. Uh, Jen and Gary, one more question before we move on to Marion's presentation uh, from Nicole. Uh, do you see any cultivar differences in susceptibility to leaf spots? Great question, Nicole, and I know you're interested in this as well. And, and uh, I, I, the answer is hopeful, yes. We, uh, whether they're repeatable differences, that's what we wanna know. We have particular opportunity uh, in the cultivar trials out, out this year uh, to try to discriminate uh, uh, varieties in the in, uh, cultivars in the sense of uh, downy mildew, for sure. And, and also, uh, I, I think with the uh, helmet, the sport with the uh, bipolaris hemp leaf spot as well. But yeah, that's a goal, and we're not there yet. Uh, perhaps in Kentucky, you got a better read on some of that. Thanks. Yep. yep. Thanks very much, Gary and Jen. Great presentation. We are going to move on. I'm going to start uh, Marion Zufle's presentation from New York State IPM. I will just give you a heads up. Uh, the audio is uh, the audio levels on this video are pretty low, uh, so you may need to turn up your volume a bit uh, once it gets started here. Good morning. My name is Marion Zufle, and I work for the New York State Integrated Pest Management Program. Today I'm going to talk to you about insect pests or potential insect pests of hemp and their management. This was my first summer working in hemp and I've really enjoyed the experience. So my goal this summer was to just go out there and learn as much as I can about hemp, try to identify any insects and diseases that are out there. So today I'm going to specifically just talk about the insect pests. We've already heard about some of the diseases out there. And so I'm just going to focus in on what insects I found. Before I get started, I first just wanted to stress the importance of scouting and identification because not everything that's out there is a pest. In fact, very few insects to date have caused enough damage to impact hemp. And this crop is still relatively new, so we don't have a lot of thresholds for any insect pests that we do find. So for this reason, it's very important for you to go out, scout your hemp fields regularly, and that way you can notice any potential problems and keep an eye on them. So what I did this summer was I scouted nine different hemp fields weekly, as well as one high tunnel. And I also set up uh, European corn borer tracks, which you can see here in the picture, next to hemp fields so I can monitor the flight of European corn borer, which is one of the known pests, potential pests of hemp. Again, not everything is a pest, so we have to be able to identify what's a pest, what's a beneficial, and what's an incidental. An insect is 
that just happens to be out in the field but isn't causing any damage. Okay, so now I'm going to go over some of the insects that I did find this season. The first one that I encountered was early in the season while the plants were still in the greenhouse. The grower came to me and he informed me that hundreds of his seedlings were dying. And you can see that from the top um, upper right hand corner. The seedlings were turning yellow and were dying and he wasn't quite sure what was causing it. And we noticed that he had a lot of fungus gnats and he also had fusarium. And we determined that it was fusarium. We took some seedlings and sent them to Chris Smart and she identified fusarium in the seedlings. So the fungus gnats, they are tiny little flies that lay their eggs in wet soil near the base of the plants. The larvae will hatch out of the eggs and then they start feeding on decaying matter, but they will also feed on roots. And both the adult fungus gnats as well as the larvae can transmit diseases such as fusarium. So what the grower did is he changed out his potting media and then he also decreased his watering. He was overwatering his plants and you're supposed to really let them dry out between waterings, let the top layer dry out between waterings. Um, and that really helped his um, fungus net problem. And he also introduced nematodes. So one thing you can do to monitor for fungus gnats is you can place yellow sticky cards in your greenhouse so that you can detect them early. Um, if you do have fungus gnats, you should allow the top layer of soil to dry out completely. This will kill both the fungus as well as, which the gnats feed on, as well as the fungus gnat larvae. So really let that soil dry out between waterings. This is the two-spotted spider mite. These are small little mites found on the underside of the leaves and they cause this stippling appearance that you can see in both of the pictures, kind of on the upper surface of the leaves. You usually notice the stippling first and then if you turn the leaf over, you'll find the spider mites. These I found in the high tunnel as well as in the field. And both, of the num both in the high tunnel as well as in the field, the numbers stayed fairly low. The high tunnel has since been harvested and no control measures were needed. And the populations in the field have never increased. I monitor it weekly and the numbers have stayed very, very low. Two spotted spider mites do prefer very hot, dry weather. So one of the ways to manage for them is to make sure that your plants aren't water stressed. You can also remove any potential weed hosts that are surrounding your field. And then if you do have a spider mite problem or you know that you will, um, you can release predatory mites to control the spider mite population. But if you do do this, you have to do it in advance of the spider mites becoming out of control. So as soon as you have that first sign of two spotted spider mites, you want to release your beneficial predatory mites. This is the red-headed flea beetle, which was probably the most numerous insect that I observed this summer. The adults are fairly large, three to six millimeters, and have a reddish brown head and a shiny black body. They feed on the leaves between the between the veins and cause these holes all over the leaves. Even though they were very numerous and I saw quite a bit of damage, all the plants grew out of it. And the young seedlings are the ones that are most at risk from flea beetle damage. So some of the control measures you can do is you can protect your young seedlings with row cover until they're large enough to withstand the feeding pressure. Uh, you can also plow in the to decrease the overwintering population. And then you can use beneficial nematodes, which will control the larvae in the soil. I also found some aphids. These are small sap-sucking insects, kind of pear-shaped. They're found on the underside of the leaves, but they can also be found near the stem or in the flowers. There are several different species of aphids that are known to occur on hemp. Of the nine fields that I was scouting, only one of them did I find aphids in, and um, they remained on the lower leaves. And there was a lot of beneficials, including ladybugs and minute pirate bugs and lacewings that really kept the population un under control. They are still out there and I'm still monitoring them weekly to make sure the, the population doesn't get any bigger. I did take a sample and I sent it to the Cornell Insect Diagnostic Lab for identification because I don't know what species it is, um, but I only found the one in one field. There are a few different insects that will bore into the stem of hemp, including the common stock borer, which is pictured here, as well as European corn borer and the hemp borer. The only one that I found this season was the common stock borer. I've not found the other ones. I did set up traps for European corn borer, but the numbers were very, very low and I never found any in the plant. So here's a picture of a larvae inside a hemp stalk. They are brown with these long white lines that run the length of the body. 
the female will lay her eggs in grasses and weeds kind of around the edge of a field and when they hatch, the, when the larvae hatch, they will move into the field looking for a suitable plant to bore into. So one of the management options is to control your weeds and grasses in the surrounding fields. Usually if you do have stalk borer, it's going to be on the edge of fields where you're going to find the damage. Another option is to plant your plants early so that they're large enough that when the larvae move in, they can withstand some of that boring damage. Chemical control options are limited because once they're inside the stem, they're protected from any kind of chemical control. This is the last insect that I'm going to talk about, the yellow woolly bear caterpillar. This is a caterpillar that feeds on many different plants, including hemp. It's covered in dense yellow hairs over its entire body. And this one I found in the high tunnel that I was scouting. And usually it doesn't cause a problem. The female lays about 50 eggs on a host plant and the caterpillars, they feed together for a little while, but then they disperse throughout the field and just cause a little bit of damage to individual plants. Um, but because this was in a high tunnel, they were all concentrated in one area and they couldn't disperse. It caused much more significant damage. So when I was in there scouting, I noticed a lot of the plants, the lower third of the plant was completely defoliated. So I notified the grower about that. And what we ended up doing, he just went in and handpicked them all. And there's probably about a hundred or so in the high tunnel, but he could control them since it was in a defined area. He could just go in and handpick them all to remove them. And it didn't really cause any serious damage because we were able to get rid of them. So here, just real briefly, is a list of some of the other insects that I found on hemp, which includes the leaf miner, which I'm attempting to rear out to determine what kind of what species it is, four-lined plant bug, various caterpillars, different grasshoppers, brown marmorated stink bug, leaf hoppers, tree hoppers, um, the oblique banded leaf roller. I was able to rear that out. Um, and the tarnished plant bug. So as you can see, there's a lot of different insects that are found on hemp. Not all of them are pests, so it's important to know what's a pest, what's just what's an incidental, and of course, as I mentioned before, what are your beneficials so that you can you just control the ones that you need to. So if there's any questions, I will take those now. Okay, thank you, Marion. Uh, Marion is on, so I see a couple of questions in the chat. We have one minute here. Uh, if you want to pick one out, uh, there's a question about uh, how prevalent corn borers have been in cornfields in New York, and uh, will this corn borer population potentially impact hemp? Um, sorry, you can hear me? Yep. Okay, good. Um, so European corn borer in general has been very low in the state for at least 10, 15 years now um, after the introduction of BT field corn. Um, we do think it might start increasing. There's more non-GMO field corn being grown, so the European corn borer population might increase. What impact European corn borer is going to have on hemp, I don't know. We have, I have personally not seen any corn borer on hemp. Um, I think hemp it doesn't tend to lodge or break as easily as corn does, so it might not if when the corn borer gets inside the hemp plant, it might not have as much of an impact on the hemp itself. Um, but having not seen it, I, I, I couldn't say for sure. And one, maybe one other question here. There's a question about uh, beneficial control of two spotted spider mites, predatory mites versus ladybugs. Do you have any uh, data on that? I don't have any data. I know the I've worked with two spotted spider mites in other crops and the predatory mites do a great job. I've never intentionally released ladybugs specifically for spider mite control, more so for aphid control. So I don't know how well the ladybugs would do on spider mites specifically. I, I do know the predatory mites do well, but I don't have any data on the ladybugs. Okay, great. Thanks, Marianne. Uh, we are going to move on uh, to Lynn Sosnowski's talk here. So let me get that queued up. Hello, oh, welcome to my talk about weeds and weed management in hemp. My name is Lynn Sosnowski and I'm an assistant professor of weed biology, ecology and management and specialty crops here at Cornell University. Weeds in any cropping system compete with the crop for water, nutrients, and light, and that can directly impact yield quantity and quality. 
Weeds that become established in crops can alter the microclimates around the plants, which can then impact disease development. And weeds can actually serve as alternate hosts for both pests and pathogens in our cropping systems. Vegetation that isn't controlled can reduce the final harvestability of the crop. And the absence of any kind of vegetation control chemicals in the hemp crop itself may necessitate the use of multiple and integrated practices to suppress weeds that become established. With respect to integrated weed management in hemp, the first step should always be proper site selection. And that means avoiding fields with perennials or extremely high weed densities. If you're gonna start clean, make sure to try and stay clean. Always manage and harvest your cleanest fields first. With respect to planting date, you might be able to plant and get ahead of weeds. For example, if the field that you're planting into has a lot of summer emerging weed species, choose an earlier planting date that allows your crop to get up and gives it some kind of competitive advantage against the vegetation it's gonna be competing with. Using a stale seed bed technique where you stimulate the germination of, of weeds and then eliminate emerged seedlings both physically and chemically can be a really useful tool. But understand that not all weeds are going to respond equally well. Species with non-dormant seeds might be better controlled under this strategy as opposed to species with dormant seeds. Make sure that you have the best planting conditions that you can achieve. For instance, making sure you have a nice even seed bed so that you have good soil to seed contact for even germination, which will improve the crop's competitive ability. Make sure that you plant with appropriate densities to minimize that open space that weeds can then colonize. If you're using transplants, this can be a really useful strategy to give your crop a competitive size advantage over the weeds. Choosing varieties can have an influence on how competitive the crop is as well, based on the heights and the branching traits that that variety um, possesses. If you're going to be cultivating, make sure you keep your rows as straight as possible to maximize cultivation performance and get the weeds while they are small, either at the white thread or the early seedling stages. If you're using plastic mulch, remember that this is still going to require weeding between beds and removing weeds that emerge through the planting holes. So even though herbicides aren't available for use in hemp directly, they're likely to be used in crops that are planted before hemp. And we have to pay attention to this because these products have rotation restrictions on the label and hemp may not be explicitly listed, but the term other crop often is and hemp is going to fall into that other crop category. So if you're interested in understanding the type of plant back restrictions that might be encountered in industrial hemp production, I suggest doing a Google search for the terms Wisconsin, hemp and rotation restrictions. And you're really likely to find this nice handout that was produced by UW Madison, which explicitly looks at the restrictions that are associated with the herbicides that are used in preceding crops. These are some of the rotation restrictions that my colleagues at UW-Madison found across multiple herbicide labels. And you can see they're extremely varied in the amount of time that you need to wait before you can plant industrial hemp. For example, for the Fusilade and Select Max labels, there was a one month rotation restriction. For something like Pursuit and Mazethapir, there was a 40 month rotation restriction. Now understand the list is not inclusive and labels can and do change and it is your responsibility to always consult the labels before making any herbicide application and before planting crops following herbicide applications. Just because we don't have herbicides currently labeled for use in hemp 
doesn't mean that we aren't looking to see how herbicides affect him. We have a lot of herbicide trials that are currently underway in the United States. And they're being undertaken for multiple reasons. The first of which is to identify active ingredients that will be safe to use in hemp and to address pest management needs in the U.S. hemp industry. The second reason is to identify herbicides that will be able to control hemp escapes that occur in following crops. And the third reason is to characterize herbicide symptomology in the case of herbicide carryover or drift injury. While there's considerable interest in conducting hemp herbicide trials, uh, very few have actually made it to formal publication stage yet. Uh, the one exception being some work that's been recently undertaken by Michael Flesner's group uh, at Virginia Tech University. And this is a really good paper where they evaluated herbicide tolerance of industrial hemp in both greenhouse and field conditions. So the objective of the research that was conducted in Michael Flesner's lab was to test hemp tolerance to both pre-emergence and post-emergence herbicides. And when we say pre-emergence herbicides, we're talking soil applied herbicides. And when we're talking post-emergence, we're talking foliar applied herbicides. They did conduct this across years and they did do the studies in both greenhouse and in field trials. And what they saw was variability across time and between growing conditions. Although with respect to the results, they did find that esmetolachlor was the least injurious of the soil applied herbicides in the field, although their greenhouse trials did suggest that other active ingredients may have potential for future research. With respect to the foliar applied herbicides, quasalifop and cethoxidin, which are both grass herbicides, were found to be the least injurious of the post products, along with clopyrrolid and bromoxynil. I'd like you to know that we're also conducting herbicide trials here at Cornell Agritech. These are the results from a preliminary screening project that we've started to look at the safety of post-emergence or foliar applied herbicides on industrial hemp. And you can see that our results largely agree with those that were uh, achieved by Michael Flesner's group. Primarily, if we're looking at percent injury, the post-emergence herbicides currently in our trial providing the least amount of injury to hemp are clethodin, which is a WSSA1 herbicide, clopyramid, and bromoxynil. So we plan to continue these herbicide screens both in the greenhouse and under field conditions this fall and in 2021. Uh, the previous slide showed you our post-emergence herbicides that we're looking at. We also have a suite of pre-emergence herbicides that we'll be evaluating. And again, we'll be doing it in both the greenhouse and field conditions. We hope to have some trials describing the impacts of herbicide carryover and drift on crop growth uh, and yield development. We're also hoping to look at the biology of hemp and evaluate its competitiveness with both current weed issues, such as velvet leaf, foxtail, bindweed, and nightshade, and up and coming problems in New York, such as palmer amaranth and water hemp. I'd like to thank you very much for attending today's talk. If you'd like to get in touch with me to discuss weeds and weed management in hemp or in any specialty crops, feel free to contact me via email at lms438 at cornell.edu, on my office phone at 315-787-2231. If you're on social media, you can find me on both Twitter and Instagram. Again, thank you so much for coming and attending my talk. I'll be present during the break if you have any questions and have a good rest of your day. Okay, thanks very much, Lynn. Uh, we now have time for our Q&A session uh, for about 15 minutes, and then we'll take another five minute break. Uh, so I've seen if uh, our panelists here could unmute, that would be great. And uh, I'll try to pick out some of the questions from the chat. Uh, there were some questions about uh, seeing leaf hoppers on hemp and gypsy moth on hemp. Uh, Marion, do you want to comment on 
the potential impact of, I think Joe meant potato leaf hoppers. Yeah. So I, I did find some potato leaf hoppers. Um, oh, it's don't remember exactly when, probably at least six, seven weeks ago now. Um, a lot of adults, they came in, I was concerned. And within two weeks, they were all gone and they did not reproduce. Now I did hear from others that they have caused problems. In the fields I were in, they never reproduced and it's mainly the nymphs that, are, that cause the hopper burn and a lot of the feeding damage. So I did not experience that. Um, I don't know if other people have had issues with, with leaf hopper, but not that I'm aware of. And for the gypsy moth, those were in the high tunnel. I found, I think about two or three. I don't know if it's actually a problem. It happened to be there. Um, I don't know if they would, how extensively they were feeding. They probably nibbled a little bit. Um, I don't think that gypsy moth is gonna be a pest. It's just one of those things that I found. So I put it in the other insects I found category. Um, yeah. So one thing, I, if I have a minute, just to mention one thing real quickly, I said that I found some aphids on hemp and I sent them to the diagnostic lab. So I received um, verification that they are cannabis aphids, which is the first verification in New York. So we have it here, um, just so everybody's aware of. Yep. We had a lot of aphids last year at the end okay. of the season. Did you get it? Did you find out what they were? Uh, I thought we did have them confirmed as cannabis aphids. Oh, you did? Okay. But, okay. Elson had told me that was, his, for as far as he knew, his first verification, but okay. Uh, let me just point it to Jamie because, uh, again, in the Vines lab, they have a lot of experience working with potato leaf hopper and hopper burn on alfalfa. And I know Jamie, if she's still on, has seen some hopper burn on hemp in Ithaca but she may not be on right now. Uh, Larry, I can talk about that. I, I was in the, the Ithaca fiber and grain plots, um, I think last week, it might've been the week before, and there's considerable damage from potato leaf hopper um, on both, uh, on all, on grain, dual and fiber. And it is quite striking and remarkable. Um, I am not an entomologist or insect person, so I don't know what stage these insects are, um, but it is occurring and striking, I will say that. So I, I don't know if they have good years and bad years, but this yeah. was definitely a good year for potato leaf hopper on hemp in Ithaca. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, going back to some of the earlier questions uh, to Allie and Chris, uh, folks were asking about uh, whether we're assaying both the volatile terpenes and uh, the non-volatile terpenes. So uh, unfortunately, we haven't had the bandwidth to do as much detailed work on the terpenes as we would like, but uh, Allie and Chris, where, where do we stand on characterization of all the different types of terpenes? Um, so we're Right now, just looking at volatile terpenes. Um, that's what we have standards for. And um, anything that's not a volatile were our uh, cannabinoids, generally, so. Yeah. Right, so um, at, the, at the end of the season, we'll um, take flowers and get um, total cannabinoid analysis and we'll be working with Dennis to try to get a broader panel of terpenes as well. Great. Uh, there's a question uh, from Jeff Kostiuk to Lynn. Any work on ethylfluralin for pre-plant application in hemp? Has minor use approval in Canada? Yeah, and I, I just sent a, a, a written response to that. So uh, yes, there there are there is some work that is being done in the U.S. in various labs looking at ethylfluralin as well as the other dinitroaniline um, herbicides, so pendimethalin and trifluralin. Uh, with I don't remember the exact results with ethylfluralin that I've seen. There has been varied response and safety uh, with respect to pendimethalin. But pendimethalin, ethylfluralin, and trifluralin are all going to be products that will be tested in our pre-emergence herbicide trials. Yeah, let me just throw out uh, a question probably to everyone, and that is, uh, what is the potential 
outcome of using some of these products on uh, the test results for CBD extracts. So there is some evidence that hemp can concentrate uh, some of these compounds. And uh, we do know through our interactions with the folks at Pixis International uh, that some of their hemp crops have uh, failed uh, in that final testing. So uh, growers definitely need to be in contact with their buyer and understand the standards uh, for testing that's going to be done in the final CBD product. Anyone wanna comment on that? Yeah, I mean, that, that's exactly right, Larry. And um, I've actually interacted with now two different growers here in the state of New York um, that have gone through quality control testing um, and had either, you know, they, um, a microbial issue. So things are, they're tested for heavy metals, for pesticides and for microbials. And um, so it is important to, to know the final market, know what's going to be tested. And then I guess I would throw it to Gary in terms of grain issues, which are really important as well. I don't know all the answers to the Chris uh, to that question. And I think it's super important as you stated there. Um, we were both on a, a conference uh, at the plant pathology meetings where speakers from Canada were telling us absolutely nothing was allowed in end products. No, no residues of a biological control, no residues of any kind of chemical. Um, so I don't know if the US industry will be uh, handled that same way, but uh, it's a real concern. Um, we're, we're focused on uh, trying to reduce any potential for mycotoxins, uh, which there's significant uh, potential there. Um, and that takes away a pretty big set of tools. If we if we can't control things during the flowering process, so that uh, maybe somebody else on the call has some insights. Uh, it, it it's a real question. Lynn, do you have any insights on herbicide carryover, or herbicide uptake from hemp? Yeah, that, that's actually a really good question. And, and that is not a topic I think that any weed scientist debate has actually addressed. Um, it's, it, there was a, in fact, a, a lot of the weed science work hasn't been addressed at all to, to date. And there was a, a, actually a paper put out last year in 2019, kind of expressly saying how far behind we are with respect to all of these questions in the discipline. So there, there's more that needs to be done. Yep. And I'll just uh, very briefly try to answer Paul's question about what specific soil testing would you recommend pre-planting? Uh, again, I, I know we have discussed this with our colleagues at Pixis. Uh, hemp is particularly good at taking up cadmium. Uh, lead, uh, you don't want to plant on a field that has lead. Uh, but we really have a lot more work to do to characterize uh, what heavy metals uh, you would want to test for and specifically avoid those fields in planting CBD hemp. Uh, there may be other pesticide residues also that you would want to te uh, test for, but we really don't have a good handle on that. That's a very good question. Uh, it's an interesting question here or comment from Raul at Rutgers that uh, they've had a substantial population of stink bugs in their CBD hemp trial. Uh, and Marion, do you want to comment on uh, stink bugs? So I've seen brown marmorated stink bugs and I found some stink bug egg masses. Um, I've actually have some pictures of brown marmorated stink bugs mating in hemp, um, but have not seen a lot of feeding damage. I mentioned the majority of the feeding damage I've seen, but it's also hard to distinguish sometimes feeding damage if I'm not ac actively seeing the insect feed. There's a lot of other sucking insects that could have caused the damage. So I have not personally observed a lot of stink bugs. The only one I've seen is brown marmorated and, um, and a few stink bug egg masses. Yeah. I was also asked a question about uh, spotted lanternfly whether hemp might be a host for spotted lanternfly. Uh, so far, as far as I know, in Pennsylvania, they have not seen, and, and I heard this from Alyssa Collins at Penn State, 
uh, they have not seen any damage to hemp from spotted lanternfly. Do you have any uh, insights on that? I Mary? have, yeah, I, I actually have no idea if they would get onto hemp or not. It seems to have a pretty broad host range, um, so potentially, but yes, I, I, I have no idea. Uh, here's a question uh, from Josh with Palmer Amaranth in New York. What challenges might we see in regard to hemp production and harvest? Are hemp harvesters, harvesters capable of doing a good job? <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, obviously have not dealt with, with hemp and hemp harvest and, and Palmer Amaranth, but I have worked with Palmer Amaranth, which is the weed behind me in almonds actually in California. And uh, yeah, that's that that goes back to the harvestability issue. Um, you know, Palmer amaranth gets very large very quickly. Uh, it gets lignified, and it, it can stop up cotton harvesters and and you know uh, corn harvesters. So I expect that a significant population will impede the harvestability of hemp as well. Yep, I'll just comment that uh, again for high quality fiber production fiber hemp production, there is a very, very low tolerance for weeds. Uh, so it has been a challenge for us in the absence of any labeled herbicides uh, to maintain and to establish and maintain a weed spotless field that would meet those quality thresholds for high quality fiber harvest. Uh, for those folks who have been looking at the chat, any final questions you want to address here in our last minute before the break? Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna throw. There was a question about crop density and uh, weed control, and that falls into that that last uh, bullet point from my slide of future research. Um, that's going to look at the competitiveness of hemp with various weed species, and uh, crop density impacts are going to be rolled into into that. So. I don't, there is work that is being done, nothing by other universities, nothing has been published yet, but I'll be doing some of that work here, hopefully in the coming um, 2021. Yeah. And, and again, we, in, in CBD hemp, at least we've relied on uh, plastic mulch heavily for weed management. But as the industry shifts to more broad acre direct seeded plantings, uh, those studies are gonna be critical. So it's great to have Lynn on our team there is a question about um, zero tall and powdery mildew and I have um, tested that so zero tall is going to sanitize whatever it touches but it will become ineffective very quickly and so um, uh, in in uh, in what we have done to date and we are expanding this but other products including um, bacillus based products and um, oil based products when applied prior to powdery mildew getting there are much more effective than the zero tall in our studies. Great. Uh, just one final uh, comment here. There have been a couple of questions about recommending labs for testings. Uh, we are we are not going to recommend a particular lab. We don't have a, a validation protocol for validating the results from different commercial labs, uh, but we do have a listing of uh, potential labs that you can use, in particular uh, ones that can test for heavy metals and toxins are, are kind of rare, they're relatively few. And uh, if you go to our website, we try to maintain a, a complete list of lab resources that you could potentially use, uh, but I won't call them recommendations. Uh, so we are going to take a break here, it's 10.56. Uh, so another five minute break and we will be back at 11 o'clock with our presentation from Alan Taylor. Thanks very much everyone to uh, our panelists. Okay, it's 11.01. We're going to uh, move on to our third session here, uh, talking about uh, supply chains and regulatory issues. We are going to start with a talk from Alan Taylor on seed treatments and soil-borne pathogens. My name is Alan Taylor, and I'm professor of seed science and technology at Cornell Agritech. My laboratory has been involved in hemp 
seed science and technology research since the Cornell Hemp team formed in 2017. What I'm going to speak about today is on our work on the research and development of hemp seed treatments. Gary Bergstrom is my cooperator in plant pathology as his laboratory is supportive in helping characterize the pathogens associated with disease seedlings from our research plots. We also have field trials at North Dakota State with Burton Johnson and Chuck Johnson and John Fike at Virginia Tech. So the focus of our work is on application technology to begin with to have good methodology for seed treatment and coating technologies. This is a laboratory scale unit called a rotary pan technology, an R6 for a six inch diameter. This same technology is used for commercial scale equipment. So anything that we do in the laboratory can quickly be scaled up to a larger. An issue that we had early on is that we need to ensure that we have uniformity of application over the seed surface and from seed to seed. We need to protect each seed from attack of the soil-borne pathogens at time of sowing. We'll take a step back and look at the biological market as there's a number of materials. Now this is not restricted to seed treatments. These could be foliar applications or soil applications and furrow applications. We have biofertilizers and biostimulants, which we're not going to be talking about, even though my laboratory is working with biostimulant seed treatments. We're going to focus on biological control products in particular the biopesticides. So we're gonna kind of focus in on that area. So under the biopesticides, we have biochemicals. They may be kind of a mineral based. They can be either formed from copper or phosphites. We have examples of those. Microbials, we normally think of a microbial as a biopesticide, but they're not the only materials. But in this case, we are using specific seed treatments of, from bacillus and trichoderma and with others, and these are commercial formulations that we are testing uh, as seed treatments. So this is our list of 12 seed treatments that we have. Those in green are the biologicals. First thing we have to do is test the seed treatment application rate. We want to ensure that there's no phytotoxicity from the seed treatments. Those in red are the biochemicals. Safeguard is an organic copper. The prudent is a phosphite material. And then the group at the bottom in blue, Apron XL Maxim, you probably recognize as these are widely labeled on vegetables and field crops for as seed treatments. So first, let's look at what happens to seeds after they're planted. We start off here in the laboratory to look at hemp seeds germinate very rapidly. So in this pathogen infested soil that we have the soil sprinkled over on top during the germination process, after four days, the seeds germinate very rapidly. After seven days, many of the seedlings have died or are dying. And by 10 days, non-treated seeds are killed. So this is a way that we can use a laboratory screening method, taking advantage of a naturally pathogen pathogen infested soil to go ahead and to test these seed treatments before we actually go to the field. But our primary interest in showing you today is the field data. This is our two, we have two st field studies at Cornell. The first one planted on June 12th. Again, now we can see how this color coding is going to help us. The black bar on the left is the control non-treated. You see all the green treatments, none of the biologicals doing any better than the control. However, the safeguard, the organic copper, the, the prudent, the phosphate doing quite well and as good as one of our best uh, apron maxim treatments. So this looks very promising. We have a second study uh, also in Ithaca this year, planted on June 26th. Again, the same trend is the biologicals not performing any better than the non-treated control. We are seeing improvements with both the safeguard, in particular the safeguard and the prudent. And again, it's comparable to our best apron maxim treatment as the chemical seed treatment. 
This is where Gary's laboratory was, was instrumental in supporting this project. We would see the symptoms in the field as far as disease seedlings. His laboratory has done the characterization of what pathogens are associated with those disease seedlings. So we can see here in the picture on the, the photo at the bottom on the left, uh, indicative of those testing positive for fusarium species. The picture on the lower right having pythium species present. Gary's laboratory is still ongoing work uh, to characterize the species uh, of these along with other samples that we have provided uh, to their lab. As I said, this is a multi-state project and being a multi-state project is good in that we do not want to simply have seeds that are tested in Cornell that only have good control in the Northeast. So we've expanded the testing. We have uh, seed testing at Virginia Tech in the southern region, and then North Dakota State in the north central region. Again, the same color coding and the same uh, scheme as we had in our previous slides. We see Safeguard and Prudent doing very well, and this is from one study we have. There'll be one more study coming with data this fall from Virginia Tech. And then North Dakota State in this case, we're seeing the chemical seed treatments doing quite well uh, in this one across the board, but still we're seeing, for example, Safeguard doing a nice job. So we're, we're gathering information now, and the very good picture is that there we're seeing some consistency in our results from field to field and from location to location within the regions of the United States. So let's go ahead and summarize where we're at with this. Our biochemical seed treatments, the Safeguard, which was the organic copper, and the Prudent, which is a phosphite, had good efficacy in all of the studies, the data that we have in hand at this point in time. The chemical seed treatments, Apron XL and Maxim, still had good efficacy. And again, these are tried and true chemical seed treatments that are widely labeled. Unfortunately, after two years of work where Syngenta was initially very interested in this project, Syngenta is no longer su providing support for hemp on any particular application. So it could be Syngenta herbicides and things like that. They're not going to be supporting those hemp labels in the United States, which is, is a big setback. So we really need uh, other chemical seed treatments from another company to test, and we're looking into that at this time. Finally, the biologicals, and we've done now two years in a row trying to test a good range of commercially available and use biological seed treatments simply were not effective in our study to control damping off. So I, I want to thank people, first of all, uh, in my laboratory, uh, Hillary Mayton, Hillary kind of headed up all the field studies that you had, as well as gathering data from the other states and then summarizing some of the data in the graphs that you're seeing. Michael Luce in my laboratory has done all the seed treatment application, a lot of the in-house testing as far as germination, soil testing, you know, soil bioassay. Masi's done a lot of the photographic work and other support work for this project. So very nice team. And I'm very fortunate to have people working with me on this project. In Gary's laboratory, uh, Jen Starr was really instrumental in working with Hillary, taking those field samples and doing the characterization. And Kevin in Gary's lab is helping at the molecular characterization so we know what species are involved. Again, we work very closely with the company registrants. In other words, the companies that actually are producing these. We're working directly with our R&D people to make sure that we're testing the best biological, chemical, biochemical treatment that they would have available for this project. And finally, I want to thank support from IR4, but in particular for New York Ag and Markets for their continued support for this and for other Cornell hemp projects. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks very much, Alan. Uh, we are going to move on now uh, because we have three short presentations. 
uh, from some of my colleagues in Cornell Cooperative Extension talking about their work on uh, the economics and supply chains, starting with John Hanchar. Morning, my name is John Hanchar. I am with Cornell University and a member of the Cornell University Hemp Group that is stunning hemp production in New York State. Lindsay Paschal and Mary Ulrich, also with Cornell University, and I have been doing research and extension work on the economic aspects of growing hemp in New York. Lindsay, Mary, and I will be presenting update type information from an economics perspective. Based upon our cost of production work, I will describe the economic environment the market signals, which growers considered earlier in the year regarding planting decisions. Lindsay will then provide update information for processing, retail, and consumer activities. Mary will discuss what do growers need to be thinking of to obtain viable hemp enterprises. Cost of production and expected prices are key determinants of growers' planting decisions. Should I produce or not? If production makes sense, then how much should I plan to supply at expected prices? Acreage and production input decisions are involved. Item one. Figure one contains information produced by Cornell University and others. For Cornell University resources, please see hemp.cales.cornell.edu. Cornell analysis for a plastic culture system suggests variable costs and total costs equal $12,600 and $13,100 per acre, respectively. The Cornell work excludes a charge for the value of management inputs required and reflects pre-planting inputs, tasked to the point where dry material is in totes ready for immediate delivery or ready for storage and future delivery. Item two, the other studies use similar cost to production methods, but the items included in time periods considered differed. For example, the University of Connecticut values include a charge for management inputs required, various marketing expenses and others. Variable costs for the five study ranged from $8,800 to $13,400 per acre. The five study average was $12,200 per acre for the variable cost measure. Total costs ranged from $9,200 to $19,300 per acre. The five study average was $14,000 per acre. Item three. Calculated break-even prices, the expected prices received that would cover variable and total costs using the five study averages, equaled $1.31 and $1.51 dollars per percent CBD per pound of dry matter, respectively. Given percent CBD equals six, dry matter per plant equal one pound, and harvested plants per acre equaled 1,500 50 plants. Expected prices for the 2020 growing and harvest year, late 2019 of about a dollar and early 2020, about 65 cents, relative to cost suggest a relatively unfavorable economic environment for hemp CBD. Item four, in summary, there are three aspects that this information supports. An unfavorable economic environment, unfavorable market signals, was being considered by growers as they made planting decisions early in the year, especially when compared to expectations for alternative horticulture crops. Risks and uncertainties still concern growers. A comment by Mary Ulrich, CCE, Eastern New York Horticulture Program, during a recent Cornell University hemp check-in call, summarizes the environment quite well. Activity, that is hemp production, is a fraction of what it was last year in the area. 
you have questions or comments, you can contact me, John Hanchar, at jjh6 at cornell.edu. Thank you. Thanks, John. I'm going to move on to Lindsay Paschow's presentation. Hi, my name is Lindsay Paschow, and I'm on Cornell Cooperative Extension's Harvest New York team. I will be discussing the supply chain for industrial hemp in New York State with discussions about state of processors, a little bit about retailers and consumers. In May 2020, a survey was sent out to the hemp processors in New York State to find out what the state of hemp processing happened in 2019. Out of a little over 100 processors in New York State, only 24 responded. Um, 13 said that they did process hemp in New York State, and 11 said that they did not. We asked, how much hemp did you process in 2019? Um, 11 respondents did not process any hemp, and then the hemp ranged between 0 and 28,278 pounds, with a total of 122,088 pounds processed in New York State, according to the um, respondents. In 2019, um, we asked what the minimum CBD content that hemp processors required um, from their growers. It ranged anywhere from 0 to 12 percent um, of CBD percentage that they would like from growers. Then we asked processors what they were processing hemp into. This included hemp oil, seed cake, um, biofuel, um, plastic raw materials, hemp fiber, pellets, um, and that was for pellet stoves, um, extracts such as powders, base oil, protein, tinctures, flour, and CBD. In 2020, um, we wanted to know what processors were looking at for their capacity um, for processing hemp. And, you know, the range is kind of all over the board, but included um, weekly basis of 200 pounds. Um, some processors said for um, a month they could only do about two acres or anywhere between 1,000 and 140,000 pounds, um, with also some processors responding that they could do anywhere from 6,000 to a million pounds um, within the year. There's not a lot of information out there um, in New York State about the state of retailers and consumers. Um, this will probably be potentially a future survey for, to find out from retailers and consumers where the industry is. Um, there's a lot of predictions online about how um, retail stores might end up closing because of COVID-19. Um, you know, a lot of people can buy CBD locally or they can buy it online. So the retail side is very unpredictable um, and so is on the consumer side. There's large predictions that CBD con consumption will continue to increase between 2020 and 2024. Um, if you have any other questions about um, hemp processors in your state, please feel free to reach out to me. My email address is lep67 at cornell.edu. Good afternoon. I'm Mary Ulrich with Cornell Cooperative Extension in Orange County. I too am on the hemp team and I'm going to address a little bit about risk and reward because of course the question this year is the reward of hemp, the potential for a profit. Uh, balance out with the risk because those two things should be in uh, direct proportion to one another but they may not be. And so has hemp been all rainbows and kittens or is it a little wild westy? I've seen a lot of wild westy out there in the last couple of years and so I'm going to address a couple of ways to uh, protect yourself from the bad actors and other potential negatives that occur. 
So how is risk measured and mitigated? You know, we use cost of production data. John mentioned that uh, it's coming along, but the future market certainly is questionable. We certainly do need more of uh, more interest from consumers to keep that price up, to keep the demand up. We also mitigate risk with crop insurance. I don't know what the payments, I haven't talked to anybody who signed up for crop insurance, and I mean the USDA FSA crop insurance. Um, so I don't know what those payments are going to be for 2020. My prediction last year was that they were either going to be really good or really bad, and so we'll see what happens with them. I'm always curious to talk to people who've had insurance. So if you've had insurance, please give me a ring because private or the federal government um, supported ones, uh, that would be, I'd love that information. So and also one way to protect yourself or to um, mitigate risk is to have a contract. And of course, with the 2018 Farm Bill, going to be brought into effect in New York State by the end of the year. Uh, there's lots of changes in the landscape happening and of course we're not used to uh, legislation changing so quickly around crops but the last few years this has been quite a little roller coaster so that in itself is a risk that you don't know where things are going to go legislatively. Of course the big force majeure or the big risk is that FDA may decide to um, regulate the crop, particularly in the case of CBD, and that could have a huge impact on markets, production, if FDA said, no, no, this is a drug and everybody has to have, uh, just like a drug, everybody has to have the same kind of testing and monitoring, then uh, there would be a lot of producers and processors that would no longer have a market because they couldn't meet those requirements. And so the other thing I just want to say about contracts, you know, if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. And um, I'm going to show you a flyer in a minute uh, that can help you out in terms of contracts. So what's the biggest thing that I see as a problem with uh, hemp contracts or hemp relationships right now is that there's no collective knowledge. You know, we ha for produce, we have the blue book so that people can go look up buyers in New York State. Um, buyers are bonded so that if uh, a seller doesn't get paid, they can go to the state and get reimbursed through that bonding process. If, you know, they really didn't get paid for something that they sold and everything was supposed to be okay and the seller just didn't get their money, there's a way to get it back. But in hemp, that doesn't exist right now. And there's no institutional memory, which we should have, or we have in other businesses. You know who is going to pay you. You know who the traditional bad actors are. You know the guys who pay in 30, 60, 90, and the ones who don't. If you don't know, your neighbors do. And so sharing information about that in other crops has been very open, in hemp it has not been. So even what little institutional memory is being gathered, it's not being shared. And so it seems like um, bad actors are going from farm to farm or from region to region and causing trouble. And certainly this isn't just about CBD. I've had it happen that folks um, selling grain came to me because they didn't get paid for their grain because the buyer said that it was moldy but didn't tell them it was moldy until like three months later. So there's no way to trace back whose fault that was. It was just very um, unfortunate. And so also very unusual relationships between value and cost the, that the, the farmer needs to buy into the processing somehow, which is really, you know, not the case. Ocean spray, you know, really doesn't need the farmers necessarily to buy into the processing part itself. They might be a co-op in terms of selling, but do they own the equipment? Maybe not. Or uh, orange juice companies or any of those there isn't that same kind of need to be involved. There's a lot of interest from people who have never been involved in agriculture. That can be a little bit of a problem. There's also what I call the billionaire rule. There's a lot of folks running around saying, oh, I have billionaire friends. Well, unless you see a picture of him with Warren Buffett, like on his Christmas card, don't believe it. So uh, one of the local growers actually said, if it's a good party, it'll still be going in a couple of years. And if it's a bad party, I never wanted to go in the first place. He said that when questioned about why he was, because he was going to grow and then changed his mind in the last minute in 19. And so just um, using caution. So to try and um, 
look more closely at some of those contract details, there's this uh, six page pamphlet. The first two pages are about production stuff, but then the next four are about contracts. Uh, I wrote it with the assistance of several attorneys, agricultural attorneys. And so uh, just have a look at that. It's on both the Cornell website and the hemp blog, which here's the pages. And so the blog is on the left. That's what it looks like. And so there's regular news updates there and updates for meetings and things like that. There's also the link for the contract thing. And on the right, don't forget that Cornell has its own website and then the team, whether it's other people you've heard from today or John or Lindsay or myself, all of our contact information is also on there on the team website. Okay, thanks very much, John, Lindsay, and Mary. Uh, we're running a little bit over time and I see Chris Logue is there ready to make his presentation. So what I'm going to suggest if people can stay on is we will extend our Q&A session uh, that will start at around 11.55 uh, beyond 12 o'clock if people can stay on. Uh, so you can ask questions to John, Lindsay, and Mary. But now I would like to move on uh, to Chris Logue, Director of Plant Industry at New York State Department of Ag and Markets. Uh, Chris, you have the floor. Thanks, Larry. Can you hear me okay? Yep, sounds great. Excellent trying a new headset today. Uh, so good morning, everybody. And uh, the first thing I really should, should say is uh, thank you very much, Larry, for having us here today uh, to talk with you. And, you know, I want to compliment you on a, on a fantastic um, uh, program today. Uh, and also the fantastic uh, research program and the great communication on industrial hemp uh, back and forth with the department, as well as with uh, the growers in New York State, as well as in other states. Um, you know, everybody, everybody uh, uh, should have received a letter or all of our uh, registered research partners should have received a letter via email uh, earlier this week. Uh, that letter should also be making its way through the Postal Service as well. Uh, we wanted to be sure that we sent that out multiple ways so that uh, folks would would uh, get uh, the message as quick as possible. Um, we really spent the last six or eight months here in the department uh, working on and looking at uh, what the requirements of the 2018 Farm Bill program were. Uh, as many of you uh, you know, know, we sent in uh, comments on the uh, federal interim rule. Uh, you all sent in many comments. There's a lot of commonality among those comments and uh, identified a number of uh, barriers related to uh, hemp for growers going forward under the 2018 rules, as well as for states going forward under the 2018 rules. We had an informal deadline uh, with USDA, uh, AMS, uh, the states did as far as submitting plans uh, for consideration. Um, that deadline was August 15th. Uh, we were deliberating here uh, within the agency and outside the agency, uh, frankly, right up until uh, that August 15th deadline about uh, what direction uh, to go in. Uh, our decision at that time was uh, that uh, we were unable to submit a compliant plan to USDA, um, which uh, sets the stage for USDA to be uh, the regulatory authority for hemp here in New York State. Um, the authority of the 2014 Farm Bill, uh, which is what we're operating on right now, uh, you all know expires on 10-31-2020. Uh, it's our intention to run a 2014 compliant program up until that uh, uh, sunsets in October of this year's, of this year, excuse me. That federal interim rule uh, has many aspects that are uh, inconsistent with what we believe the con congressional intent was. 
uh, when the 2018 Farm Bill was passed. We think that intent was uh, in line with what our beliefs here in New York have been, which is to consider that industrial hemp is an agricultural commodity and uh, that the farm bill was really to, you know, continue to stimulate and develop the industry. Some of the things that we found uh, particularly difficult to deal with uh, were the testing requirements and the destruction requirements, but there's a number of other, other issues that we and Others, including growers in New York and other states, um, have identified that are problematic. We feel that the uh, interpretation of this uh, section of the Farm Bill and the corresponding sections of the federal interim rule uh, really show that they've been uh, most likely heavily influenced by Department of Justice and the DEA had a number of conversations over the past several months with USDA um, regarding what the legal boundaries are for a uh, state hemp program and uh, what could or would be approved in a hemp plan and what the required regulatory activities would be. In the final analysis, uh, the components of an approved state plan are essentially the same as federal oversight of the program. In short, the rules are the same after 1031, whether the state or the federal government is the primary authority. And states that, that uh, sign on for um, uh, being the primary regulatory authority are really operating as uh, agents, if you will, of the federal government. Our feeling is that submission of a compliant plan really uh, is an affirmation that the state agrees with the federal interim rule and it certainly legally obligates us to carry out the plan as submitted. Um, submitting a compliant plan with the intent of, of not following it really is, is uh, in our opinion, a disingenuous act. Um, and we think that by not submitting a plan to USDA, New York State is really sending a clear message to USDA that the requirements are unworkable and unnecessarily burdensome to the states and the growers. Uh, we feel as though there are several states that are on the cusp of uh, following us in this action of not sending in a plan and uh, not at liberty right now to, to name particular states that are considering this. We need to uh, respect their sovereignty and respect their decision-making process in that but we do believe that you'll see some other states that, that take this action as well going forward. I wanna transition a little bit to the letters that we sent to USDA, as well as the ones that we sent out to our research partners. They, both letters reference our strong commitment to hemp in New York State. Uh, we as a department, as an agency, and I think uh, as a state government, we're all still very much committed to hemp as well as, as its economic potential for New York farmers. Um, I was very interested to see and hear the economic analysis uh, that John uh, Hanchar and uh, Lindsay and, and Mary presented earlier here today. Um, and I saw some of the comments in the, in the chat box. Uh, I think it's, uh, I think the, uh, this industry is, is having growing pains clearly but it still clearly has a lot of potential for New York producers as well as others. Um, so where are we right now? So getting back to our commitment to growers, we uh, you know, stand ready to assist our hemp growers with the transition to a federal licensing structure. We wanna have that be in the most uh, seamless and orderly way possible. We're gonna do everything in our control to make this happen. One thing that I think is, is really uh, been a fantastic thing about the hemp program here in New York, and I think in other parts of the country, and it's, a, and it's a real positive thing, is the enthusiasm and the entrepreneurship. Um, and what we've seen in New York is uh, that enthusiasm and entrepreneurship really uh, has led to a lot of, um, you know, uh, specific nuances in your business. Um, you know, that's a great thing that some of those nuances perhaps uh, complicate the transition over to the USDA program. 
but we are certainly gonna uh, uh, work with you to get you into that uh, program in the best way possible um, with the least uh, legal and uh, financial risk. We're gonna also continue to advocate for adjustments in the federal program and a more flexible regulatory structure. Um, so a couple things uh, just to talk a little bit about some general information uh, with the transition over to uh, the federal side of things. Uh, one thing that again is a really positive is that actually one of our staff people here at the department uh, took a position with the USDA program. And so we have really a very strong relationship with the folks at AMS because of that. And we also have really good communications with the folks at AMS uh, because of that uh, connection with our former staff person. So we've had some initial conversations about what we think this looks like. Um, so just a couple of general things that we're working on. And again, there are a lot of specific questions that need to be answered. And um, uh, we're going to work through those over the next uh, weeks to help you out. But just a typical field grower, as we've had the conversation uh, with USDA, that typical field grower should probably plan on having their harvests complete by, uh, by the uh, end of the 2014 Farm Bill Authority and then uh, proceed to register with the USDA. Once you're registered with the USDA, you're gonna be subject to the federal requirements. Our understanding is, is that you cannot have the federal license and the state registration at the same time. Um, you also wanna have all of your testing of the current year's crop done and in hand uh, before that happens. So the complicating factors are gonna be places that uh, are growing plants for planting or perhaps that have their plants um, uh, in greenhouses and we're gonna work closely with those folks. A um, Couple things on sampling. So the USDA program does not require the sampler or the lab at this point to be DEA registered at this time. I think in the original version, of the interim rule, they did have that requirement. Uh, we think this potentially creates some opportunity for some service providers in the state, whether they be soil and water conservation folks or certified crop advisors or perhaps organic certifiers to help out uh, with the uh, sampling requirements. And we're told that there are some good training resources for potential samplers on the USDA website. A little bit here quickly on the federal application process and reporting under the federal program. Uh, the first step in the federal process is going to be uh, to get your FBI background check. Uh, you have to have that in hand at the time of application. It can be no older than 60 days old when it's submitted to the USDA. Um, I'm told that uh, USDA is having some interactions with New York growers that uh, uh, some of the issues around the Postal Service right now um, are creating a little bit of a, a delay in background checks. There is a web-based service that can do a background check, which is, a, uh, I'm told, more expensive. I think it's $50 rather than $18, but we'll try to get that information linked up on our website soon. Once you've got the, app, or the uh, background check and plan, in hand, I should say, you would uh, fill out your uh, application. It's a one pager. There is no fee associated with that application. Uh, it would get submitted to uh, USDA. And we're in conversations with USDA about whether those applications should be com coming in right now or whether they should be held uh, until November 1st. Uh, one of the things that, that is a, a factor in this is as other states make a similar decision to what the decision that we made here, uh, their licensing volume is going to increase. Either way, what we think will happen is that uh, the licenses on the federal side will be issued with an effective date of November 1st, 2020. So once the license is reviewed or the application is reviewed on the federal side, the app successful applicant is gonna receive the license document and then you would need to go to the local USDA FSA Service Center 
uh, to register your uh, specific production locations. I'm told that that information uh, is going to then be shared with uh, uh, law enforcement authorities. Um, you know, my experience with FSA is that they have very robust uh, GIS capabilities. And so uh, that may actually result in some better communication with, um, with law enforcement. So uh, a couple things where we'll still be involved here uh, at Ag and Markets. Certainly, um, we still see a very strong role for us here around uh, the issues around seed quality, seed certification. Um, you know, we've talked quite a bit with some of the seed suppliers about um, being uh, in compliance with the seed laws. We'll also be uh, working, continue, continue to work on plant health and plant quality issues. If you're a producer who is selling hemp transplants to other entities, you would continue to maintain your uh, nursery grower registration with us. You would continue to have an inspection uh, once per two year licensing cycle, um, you know, to document the, the health of the plant material coming out of your operation. So uh, we still have a long list of questions to answer. Again, I wanna reaffirm the commitment we have to all of you. Um, I know following you know, my, con my uh, presentation here or my comments here, we've got uh, one of my colleagues, Pat, with uh, the Department of Health, who's gonna talk about where we're going on processing. And um, you know, please keep in mind, we're here to, to help you and to make this transition as as uh, pain-free and easy as possible. So I appreciate it. Also wanna say that I appreciate very much, uh, you know, the great way that all of our field staff and inspectors have been treated by this uh, industry. Um, it's been a real pleasure uh, working with all of you. We'll continue to work with you and, and help you in any way that we can. And uh, as always, uh, we're here for you. Thank you. Thanks very much, Chris. Uh, and again, it has been a great research partnership with New York State Ag and Markets. We hope to find a way to continue that. Uh, I will say that uh, your name is still listed on the USDA AMS website as the contact for New York State. Uh, so I sent an email this morning uh, to USDA to try to find out who our contact will be with USDA in New York State when we have questions. Uh, but yeah, a lot of the questions in the chat box right now refer to the future of CBD processing and processing licensing. Uh, so I am just gonna move right on to Pat McKeach from Department of Health, and he can describe uh, what the future of CBD processing regulations will be in New York State. Pat? Great, thank you. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yep, sounds great. Awesome. So uh, my name is Pat McCage and I work for the uh, New York State Department of Health and I'm part of the team here setting up the cannabinoid hemp program. And uh, as Chris was, uh, I'd like to echo what Chris was saying. Uh, this has been an absolutely phenomenal uh, presentation this morning, learned so much. And so thank you to Larry for, for inviting us and, and allowing us to kind of give an update on, on the, the cannabinoid hemp program here. Um, unfortunately, uh, we were hoping that the regulations were going to be out by now, so uh, we could kind of get a little bit more into the, the meat and potatoes of what the program will look like, but uh, we are being told that they're at the last stage of, of approval, so we're, we're hoping they'll be out within the next uh, couple weeks here, which will kind of give a clearer picture uh, of everything that, that will be in the program. Um, I also want to highlight that uh, there's a public comment period associated with those regulations. So, um, you know, you, you guys are obviously, you know, involved in the industry, studying the industry, experts in, in hemp and, and uh, what's kind of the cutting edge movement now. And we definitely encourage, encourage you guys to submit comments because, uh, you know, we're, we're not going to get everything right the, the first time. And uh, viewing this more as a partnership will, will definitely help us, help us make the best, you know, cannabinoid hemp program we can. Um, and and I, I think we're up to now, what, 16 different states that have uh, their own unique kind of uh, 
cannabinoid hemp or CBD regulations out there. So it really is a, a rapidly developing regulatory framework right now. There's a pat, patchwork of different states and we borrowed a little bit from others. We borrowed a little bit from the dietary supplement industry, from the food regulations. And uh, we're hoping, hoping just to make something that works and is flexible. So getting started uh, today, just want to talk a little bit about the legislative background, kind of the history of how, how the bill came to pass and um, uh, why it was kind of placed at the, at the Department of Health Medical Marijuana Program. And we'll go over the program objectives for what we're trying to accomplish here, a uh, brief description of the different license types between processors and retailers, um, look at the product standards that we're trying to trying to hold these to, and really those are really building off of the great work that Ag and Markets has already done. And then uh, a quick timeline and next steps so we can kind of uh, telegraph what the next three to six months will look like. So as many of you are probably aware, a, a bill passed in, in early 2020 establishing a hemp program in New York State. And as uh, Chris just, just mentioned in the last uh, segment there, uh, the USDA will actually be, be uh, regulating cultivation for over the 2021 uh, grow season due to kind of the, the cumbersome requirements for the interim final rule. And then the processing and retailing of cannabinoid hemp will be going over to the Department of Health. Now, uh, it was really placed there to kind of build off the expertise that had been developed from regulating the medical marijuana program. Um, there's a lot of synergies in terms of how, how the plant is extracted, uh, packaging and labeling requirements, manufacturing requirements, uh, testing. So we figured it would be a, a good place to kind of merge and, you know, always thinking about the taxpayer, uh, sharing some resources here so we can, can um, get, a, get a good head start. And I, I want to uh, highlight this first uh, sub-bullet here about the transition from a research program to a traditional license program because it, it is really significant. Um, when Ag and Markets first developed their program back in 2015, it, it was really you know, focused on what we heard today and research. And then all of a sudden CBD exploded and everyone wanted to grow it, everyone wanted to process it. And it, and it became much more about the, the marketability and the commercialization aspects of, of hemp, which, which is great, but under a research program, you're kind of limited in, in, in the sort of uh, relationship between the regulator and the licensee. So, so uh, under this new framework, we're, we're hoping that we can really uh, grow and help develop the hemp industry in New York State. So what are we talking about? Uh, cannabinoid hemp. Um, cannabinoid hemp is defined as any product that is used for its cannabinoid content for human consumption or topical application. So hemp seed oil, hemp protein powder, uh, those are you know, GRIS, they're regulated as food, they would still be under Ag and Markets purview, um, and uh, industrial applications, and, you know, bioplastics, textiles, that's not part of the scope of the program either. We're really focused on things that are being sold for their cannabinoid content and being, you know, ingested in the human body or applied to the skin. Um, and I also want to highlight that it, it was a conscious choice to use cannabinoid rather than calling it the CPD program. You know, I, I think you, we heard from the panels this morning, you know, CBG is getting big, uh, terpenes and, and, and those come up daily. And uh, I'm not going to comment on it, but we're getting, a, or I'm seeing a bunch of articles about Delta 8 THC and uh, what the 2018 farm, uh, farm Bill might have done to, to impact that. So um, it's always interesting to be involved in this industry. So what we're really trying to do here at the Department of Health in terms of uh, objectives is, is the first one here is we just want to comprehensively regulate cannabinoid hemp products in New York State. So what, when we were drafting the regulations and we were talking with people in the industry or, or just people kind of in, in New York State, uh, there's so much ambiguity right now and because of the lack of, of federal guidance that some of the most common questions are, are just like what's allowed and what's not allowed. So that's definitely one of the main main focuses of the program is just trying to provide a clear baseline of, of what will be allowed in, in New York State. Uh, the second bullet point here is definitely a huge pillar, especially for us at the Department of Health. Um, you know, consumer protection and, and uh, quality control standards are a huge, huge aspect of the program. We want to make sure that products on the shelf have been tested, are labeled properly, and manufactured to a certain standard. 
and give and give consumers some uh, some assurance that when, when they're buying something, it, it actually contains cannabinoids. They're not getting ripped off, and and they have you know the appropriate warnings or disclosures of of what's in the bottle. And kind of tied into that is is this last point about education and enforcement. So we we definitely understand that you know you can have the best rules in the world, but if, if people aren't following them or they're not being uh, enforced it doesn't really matter. So uh, education and enforcement are going to be a really key pillar of the program. And um, I, I, we're small now, but we're hoping that we can ramp up in terms of resources over the next few years and dedicate a lot of, a lot of, a lot of uh, those resources to that effort. So a quick overview of the license types in the new program. Um, we split the processor into two different licenses. So there's the extraction and manufacturing license and then the manufacturing only license. Uh, the, the key difference here is really um, the, the extractor license because you know, you're using different equipment and different technologies and there's a different level of risk for extraction that that is gonna be its own kind of a license type assuming that not every business will wanna do that. And then the manufacturing only license will be uh, businesses who are purchasing kind of that intermediary product that's already been extracted. So your isolates, distillates, whole plant extracts, and then manufacturing a product from there. So really just the idea there was just to, uh, allowing different uh, opportunities for businesses to, to enter, enter the supply chain uh, based on their business model. And the last uh, license here is the hemp retailer license. Um, our idea here is really to make it more of a permit or a registration. Um, this is just a way for the department to kind of get some insight into where these products are being sold, um, and then also gets our foot in the door so we can start educating these retailers about, you know, how to source a quality cannabinoid hemp product, what to look for on the label, has it been tested, does it say how many milligrams of CBD are in it. And uh, from there, you know, we'll have a piece of paper that says, well, you agreed that you were going to check for the X, Y, and Z, and you're not, so that'll kind of help us on the enforcement side as well. And, and again, you know, there's potentially 10,000 uh, places in New York State uh, that could be selling uh, cannabinoid products uh, within the first year. So uh, the product standards, for, for those of you who are research, partnership, uh, uh, research partners in the Ag and Markets program right now, a lot of these bullet points should look really familiar. Um, thank you, Chris, for, for creating a great program over there. We, we plagiarized, copied, and stole a lot of good ideas from that program. So uh, in regards to manufacturing, um, you know, we don't, we don't want to reinvent the wheel here. Uh, there's already uh, good regulations out there in terms of good manufacturing processes for both food and dietary supplements. And uh, we kind of want to build off that as a foundation and then layer on those additional um, concerns uh, that are unique to cannabis. So uh, packaging and labeling is a great example. Um, because this is such a new industry, um, it, it's all about consumer awareness. We want to make sure the consumer knows what they're putting in their body, how much they're, they're uh, consuming. Uh, there's a QR code so they can, they can check that the, the product has been tested and been labeled. And then um, warnings and disclosures are also extremely important, especially when you're talking about you know, a, a full spectrum product that could potentially cause someone to, to fail a drug test. You want to be upfront about that information because that could affect someone's life. So um, we're, we're looking to add things like that. Uh, in regards to laboratory testing, um, uh, we're going with the 17025 ISO accreditation. Um, another, uh, a couple other states are also going with that. Uh, I think it's popular in, in the uh, medical marijuana and adult use industry as well. Um, so we're kind of building off that. And, and as these programs grow, the, the quality of the third party lab sector should also grow with it. So uh, that'll be definitely a work in progress. Um, we're requiring a full panel of testing for cannabinoid hemp products. I mean, similar to the medical marijuana and the adult use standards, you know, you're still putting it in your body, so it should be tested for, you know, residual solvents, microbials, heavy metals, et cetera. So that really is the, the program in a nutshell. Um, I, I wanna highlight again, that the regulations should be out relatively soon. Uh, we definitely encourage everyone to, to give feedback on them. And I also wanna highlight that they are proposed regulations. So things will not be written in stone. We'll have opportunities to make changes and um, new licenses should be available. We're, we're shooting for early 2021 um, for on the, both the processor side and the retail side. So 
please be on the lookout for additional information there. Uh, we're working on setting up a, a cannabinoid hemp website so we could post some of this stuff online and also setting up a, a call center number so we can we can take your calls. Um, we, we do have a shared email that's on my next slide. I, I can share that at the end here. Um, but quickly, the, the last point here is we also are working in tandem with Ag and Markets on the transition of existing research partners over to the DOH program. So uh, we really want to make that as seamless as possible. As I already mentioned, a lot of the requirements will be similar. So it'll kind of just be working out those who are operating, those who are not operating, and getting all the, the boxes checked on the application to, to make it as seamless as possible. So once again, thank you to Cornell for letting us give this uh, update. Um, if you want to see, if you want to contact us, we're more than happy to answer questions. The, the email is hempathealth.newyork.gov. And uh, thank you. I will kick it back to Larry now. Thanks very much, Pat. Uh, we're very close to the uh, scheduled uh, time of completing our field day, but I want to go another 15 minutes or so uh, to try to let uh, mainly you and Chris answer some of these questions if you can. Uh, one of the main questions I've seen is uh, how will USDA define a grower or a producer? Is that the landowner or uh, would it be uh, someone who's renting the land, for example? Chris, do you have a, an idea? I'm not sure I can answer that. So, so Larry, I think my sense is, is that it's going to be very similar to how we defined it. Um, and again, this is, these are all details that, um, that we need to work through with them. But my sense is it's the farmer is registered with them. Um, and then the locations, you know, get registered through Farm Service Agency. Uh, Dan is asking who needs to have the FBI uh, identity history summary. Uh, my reading of that was it was the principles of the firm, right? I would agree with that. Yep. Uh, so not necessarily uh, all of the staff or investors. And of course, at Cornell University, we are in discussion with our general counsel because the principal of Cornell University is our president and our board of trustees. Yeah, I think we I think we crossed that bridge ourselves on that a while ago, right? Between the state and Cornell. <laughs> uh, so I, I just got an email from our general counsel saying, Larry, you're going to apply as an individual, right? <laughs> uh, uh, another question that has come up uh, quite a bit from Pat, and we get this question quite a bit, is uh, will Department of Health be regulating uh, smokable flour? How, what will the regulation of that look like under the DOH program? Yeah, so I, I will make the caveat that our, our regulations are not, are not final yet, so this is all subject to change, and even when they're posted, they're, they're still subject to change. But at the time, we are, we are uh, looking for a pathway to allow flour. However, um, we are going to restrict the, the uh, forms that can be sold. So no pre-rolls, no hemp cigars, no cigarettes. And, and that's really done from a, a public health perspective to not really encourage the combustion of these products. And then recognizing that you know, they are available in other states and online. And um, there's also other uses, such as hemp teas and throwing them in uh, flour or making your own edibles at home. So uh, at this time, th that is the direction we're heading, uh, but uh, please be on the lookout for those final regulations. Another question, I think, for Chris, although maybe not a Division of Plant Industry question, uh, can we extend our New York grown and certified status to our hemp crop and cannabinoid products? So uh, not a plant industry question, Larry. I would have to kick that to um, one of our folks in ag development and certainly can, uh, can try to get an answer to that for you. Uh, I think I've seen questions regarding uh, holding material after November 1st. Uh, so will you need to be licensed with USDA to hold, uh, let's say, dried hemp material? Certainly if you have uh, clones growing in your greenhouse on November 1st, First, as we will have, uh, we need to have a USDA license. But what about uh, tested harvested material? 
So we've actually, as we've been kind of uh, participating in this uh, webinar today, we've been having some uh, side conversations with USDA with some of those questions and we're gonna try to get a firm answer on that. Um, the initial answer we have on that is, is that anything that is, you know, out of the ground, harvested, tested before October 31st should be to the, uh, to the state standard. Anything that, you know, is still in the ground and the testing and such is not completed by October 31st goes to the to the federal standard. I think one of the things that we really need to get a bead on, Larry, is, you know, I know there's some product out there that has been stored for a longer period of time that, you know, folks are, are waiting, frankly, for uh, better market conditions. And we need to get a sense of that because I'm not sure, uh, well, I know that our former staff person who now works for USDA understands that. I'm not sure people higher up the chain in USDA have a sense of that. So we can work on that one. Yeah. Uh, Pat, here's, there's a question. Can you talk about the application process for retailers? Yeah, definitely. So uh, we're actually, we're in the process now of uh, developing an online application for that. Uh, trying to make it kind of as easy as possible. It, it's not meant to be really a, a barrier of entry and uh, is really more of a permit, a registration, at which uh, you can kind of just get an idea of, of where these places are being sold and then um, can provide some education to them. And uh, similar to the process for licenses, we're hoping to roll that out in early 2021. Great. Uh, there's a question, what will the mechanism of enforcement be for non-compliant hemp products in New York State beginning in 21? That's a question for you, Pat. How, are, how is DOH going to enforce all of these new regulations? That's a great question, and we are definitely working through that now right here. Um, like I said, I, I think the first year will really be focused on education and trying to get people understanding what the new rules and regulations are. We understand that uh, a lot of these people have, have products that they've already purchased in anticipation you know, for the next six months. So uh, th there will be some, some type of grace period there for stuff that's on the shelves now. Um, and, and then from there, I think it's, you know, we're gonna take best practices from, from ag and markets and what we learned in the medical marijuana industry in terms of uh, you know, uh, testing products, doing random sampling, uh, secret shopping, stuff like that to kind of make sure that uh, things are properly labeled and manufactured. Yeah. There have been a lot of comments about the uh, federal limits or compliance limits for THC. Uh, folks should know that the National Farm Bureau Federation is lobbying Congress for uh, a 1% total THC limit as well as many of the uh, hemp industry groups. If you are not a member of Hemp Industry Association or other uh, national hemp uh, associations, uh, now may be a good time to consider joining some of those uh, to, because they are, they are involved in that advocacy. Uh, there was a question, uh, Chris, if, folks are only one year into their license, will they get a refund? So uh, that's a great question, Larry. Unfortunately, you know, that that's an application fee uh, that we had with this program and, and we are not going to be in the position to, to prorate those licenses. Uh, so a question for Pat, will existing research partner processors be grandfathered into the DOH, DOH program? What would be the transition for existing license holders? Yeah, so, so we've been, uh, we actually started the outreach uh, about a month ago to kind of do a level set and we're working with Ag and Markets now to kind of get a, a good snapshot of kind of where everyone is in the process. We understand that, you know, COVID really threw a wrench into a lot of people setting up their facilities and getting all their extraction equipment ready and stuff like that. So our goal here at DOH is really to work with all the research partners to help them transition as seamless as possible. Um, everyone will have to apply uh, under a new license because it is a new program, 
but um, we're hoping to really spell that out and make it make it as easy as possible to kind of shift over. So uh, you know, people who are in operation can continue, and those who are still setting up will understand the new requirements and uh, can hit the ground running. Yeah, I think there's a similar question for folks who will need to transition from the state program to the federal program. When should they start? We've got just a little bit more than two months now. Uh, I started filling out my application this morning and looking at the FBI identity history summary check, there is a, a big notice here on the website that if you submit that via mail, the current processing time is 12 weeks. Uh, there is an online process that they say will only take four to five days. Uh, but if you are uh, currently a grower and will need a grower's license on November 1st, I would encourage you to get that paperwork in quickly. So, and Larry, if I can jump in here real quick on that, because I see those, those uh, questions in the chat as well. Um, we're we're in conversations with USDA on how best to do this. And, um, you know, there's, there, there could be a scenario where uh, they hold applications uh, and then, uh, you know, they would, if they, if they were holding them, in other words, if they got my application today, they would take a look at it. They would determine whether it was complete or not. Uh, if it was incomplete, they'd return it. They would then uh, perhaps hold it until the end of October, issue the registration. With a couple of other states that, that frankly are, are uh, bigger in hemp production than New York on the cusp of, of making similar decisions that we made, they're thinking that they don't want to get backed up. And what they may do is to, um, you know, start accepting uh, those applications, acting on them, and actually issuing the license document with a November 1st effective date. So what I would, would ask is um, that folks uh, allow us to have a little bit more conversation with USDA and see how they want to handle this. Um, you know, as an as a administrator who, who faced the tidal wave of, of 2017 and 2018, uh, you know, I still want to maintain a, a respectful and collegial relationship with, with USDA, particularly since, uh, you know, one of their key staff people worked for me and I have a lot of respect for, for her personally as well. So, um, so let us work this a little bit. Um, I don't see the answers to these types of questions uh, as far as timing of applications taking particularly long and so if we had even a week or so to kind of work through that and then get that information up on our website as well as being able to distribute it through your uh, lists I think that would be super. Yep. Yeah I will say that uh, at a recent national conference I was involved in Bill Hoffman who was running uh, the USDA program uh, I, I would say was conflicted because he wants to serve the interest, interests of the farmers, uh, but is bound by the rulemaking process at USDA. Uh, so uh, I, I hope they will, they will maintain that, that yep. attitude of keeping the interests of farmers. Uh, I, I have to say, despite our clear policy differences here, Bill is, seems to be a very, um, you know, a very thoughtful person, and I think really wants to see this industry grow. And uh, I think he can be a strong advocate for it. But again, he's, you know, I, I've, con I've, I've compared his situation to where we were in the state in 2015 and 2016, when we put our first reg in place, which if you remember, had the requirements for the security fences and was going to cost everybody fifty, sixty thousand dollars an acre to comply with there, you know, give them some time to work through this. Yep. Just a couple of final notes here. Uh, in the regulations, there is an application window to USDA. Uh, that would close on October 31st. So again, get going on your application. Uh, and uh, there's a comment here that uh, the FBI check 
did come back quickly. I think that's if you do it online. Uh, any final comments, Pat or Chris? Uh, because we're going to wrap this up here. Just that uh, it, it, excited to keep the dialogue going. You know, please email us there. If we're uh, happy to work together on this and uh, make the best program we can. Yeah. So thank you. <laughs> Yeah, Larry, thanks for the opportunity today. And I appreciate the thoughtful questions from the participants as well as, uh, again, how, how uh, respectful everybody has been of uh, our staff here in Albany, as well as the folks we've got out working in the field. Appreciate it. Yep. Thanks very much to you, Chris, and to Pat, as well as to our other panelists, uh, John, Lindsay, and Mary. Uh, again, when you have questions, uh, they're your first point of contact, Cornell Cooperative Extension. They're, they're very knowledgeable, have been building the knowledge base in New York State for three years now. Uh, so I really uh, uh, want to thank everyone for joining us. We, we hit about 270 attendees at the peak. Uh, so we had pretty broad, broad impact uh, nationally as well. Uh, so I want to thank again all of our speakers and panelists and thank uh, you for attending. Uh, we look forward to hopefully an in-person or a hybrid in-person and online field day in 2021. Thanks very much, everyone. Thank, Thank you, you, Larry. Larry. Thanks. Well done. This has been a production of Cornell University on the web at cornell.edu.